Okay, hold on, guys. What's going on here? What? Oh, the Muhammad Rajim. All right, guys. How you guys doing? Should I be out here or should I be in the kitchen? You guys want me? Me here in the kitchen. I got to hit some weights, man. My shoulders are narrow. Right. Out here in the kitchen. We got to clean up. Talk to the process. We're just waiting for our friend to show up. How you guys doing? Name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Creator of heaven and earth, <clears throat> and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died, and was buried in the Senate hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and dead. <clears throat> I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. The forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, life everlasting. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, Lord be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever and to ages of ages. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, dude, don't be live streaming when I'm live streaming, dude. All you do is do these boring sessions where you challenge people to come and you torture us by these monologues that are not edifying. So let me know, Lord willing, what time you're going live later. Okay, God logic is God logic. It's God logic. What's up, Sal? What's up, man? Sal, your pal. I haven't seen you in ages, bro. This guy. Man, this guy's ugly as sin. What's up? Sam, God bless you, bro. May the Lord Jesus bless us all. Now, Amen. what's going on? What are you doing? Amen. I have no weights, man. I got my shoulders are very narrow, man. I did I look narrow, but it's God like I see you're walking outside too. On what? You're walking outside too, because you got the tan lines. Yeah, that was uh called by yesterday because I gotta start because I was away. I wasn't home. I was away, so I have to get back in the saddle thing, start working out so I don't look like you. But anyway, what's up? This is it right here. Now share the link. Okay. Let's do that. All right. I'll follow this here. Go on Zerka stream. Well, what? why should I go on the stream? Should I force myself on the stream? King Asher of Assyrian. How you doing? <laughs> follow the spirit. Uh, guys, you see the Calvinists are very upset from yesterday's debate. Even Chris Date, who I gave a shout out, manifested, started foaming at the mouth and the fingertips and decided to take a shot at homin at hominem me because you couldn't refute the facts. What's up, Ricky? Talk to me, bro. People are saying I'm getting weight like you. I need to lose weight again. Come on. I've been on a food binge. But anyway, here is the link to his TikTok. If you guys want to go, you go there and bring your challenges and objections there. Okay. On TikTok, here it is. Let me pin it. Did you title it? What are we doing? What are we discussing? Yeah. So the main the main thing is is sincere questions only. That's what, what I titled it with Sam. So or anything yeah. at anything the end. Good. What's that? Anything good? Let's see. Yeah, we we have. Uh, I'm saying any anything goes. Not anything good. Like any topic. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. As the spirit, as the spirit of God leads you, but we, we do have. Let's do this. We have a first question, if you don't mind. He's well, not here sure. first. He's not. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll give you the question in just a moment. But <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we come before you, asking you, right, to wash us in your precious blood and to forgive us our sins, and to anoint the lips of Sam as we come together as a collective body in order to edify the body. And Lord. May you use Sam as a light to bring outsiders in as well. May you bring people who are sincere in their questions. And may your name be exalted above every name. And may you sit enthroned on Sam's heart, on my heart, ordering every one of our steps according to your goodwill and purpose, Lord. May this live stream glorify you and make you known. You are worthy, Lord. We love you. 
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Lord, Father, and the Spirit. <clears throat> Elijah, don't be so confident and don't flatter yourself. Challenge me. You want me to answer lovingly, respectfully. But when you say challenge me, you're calling me to come in beast mode. You don't want to do that. So, guys, I just gave you the link right there. It's pinned. You got to go on his TikTok because we're doing it live from TikTok. You guys know the rules. In my comment section on YouTube, mods, do not let them distract and talk about irrelevant issues because this is still like a class setting. We're going to let the Holy Spirit be our teacher. We, his mouthpieces, filled by the Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ as he gives us the health and vigor and holiness we need. As he strengthens my throat, speaks life to my throat, make my voice pleasing to the ears of his servants. Give us perfect recall of every jot, little portion of scripture. Destroy all forgetting those, all error and sin. And I pray then in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit will not <clears throat> allow me to be a nuisance to my neighbors because it's late for them. So focus for the glory of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, you guys can bring me your sincere objections, challenges. And if I feel led by the Spirit, he's the teacher, I'll answer. Or I might defer it to my articles or rebuttals. But go to TikTok. That's where you're going to ask your questions on TikTok. Now, I don't know where you got that picture from. How old that picture is? Me in the background wearing a shirt and jacket. I don't know how old that was. It's about a year, eight months. Really? I don't yeah. remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did wear that. Because I don't remember, man. I don't remember wearing that. Where did I wear that for? Um, but, anyway, but anyway, get to the top. It's not about me because, you know, I'm just too good looking, you know, for you to even focus. So don't focus on me. Uh, <laughs> All right. So the first question, and the guys in the audience, right, is on Hebrews 7.3. I don't have to go further in this. You already know what the question is going to be. Yeah. Without father and mother, without the beginning of days or end of life, without genealogy, but made like the Son of God, he abides as a priest forever. Melchizedek. You got it. What about it? <clears throat> is that the Son of God? No. So what's the follow-up question? I want to see. Guys, I want to see if my love hymns got bigger. Look. Have they gotten bigger? Don't hate later, hater. <laughs> All right. Does it look like I got bigger, my love handle? Come on, don't lie. No, because you know your uh, biceps are taking over. Yeah, and I don't even hit weights. Can you imagine if I'd hit weights for six months, my muscles come out? This is no weight training. Pray I get my cardio in. Is what you want to see? Because you were saying I look bigger, and I'm starting to hate you. <laughs> Where? Where am I looking bigger, dude? Where? Where? Look. Where, dude? Where? Anyway. <laughs> okay. No, that's not the Son of God. Is there a follow-up question? I yeah. Mean, the follow-up question would be, what does it mean without father, without mother, mm -hmm. without genealogy, having that's neither? Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> if we don't read the context, we won't understand the point. Now, here's what I'm thinking. Should I screen share the Bible or you're just going to read? I'll read. I'll be happy to read. All right. Read Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 3. Okay. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God remains a priest continually. So, Racino, why don't you stop hating, dude? This shirt actually is black. It makes me look leaner. Why are you such a hater, man? Just because you do my thumbnails. Okay, we read the context, right? <clears throat> now, we ask the Holy Spirit to give us perfect attentiveness, illumination, clarification, to know the scripture, live out the scripture, love the scripture, obey the scripture. And to fall more passionate in love with the Father, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, if you guys were listening, he just read the passage. The passage states, the word Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Right? Mm -hmm. Zedek, like Zadir, Zadok, Melki, Zedek, king of righteousness. All right? And then it says, king of Salem. Shalem. Shalem. Okay, so Shalom also comes from Shalom. They come from basically same root, Shalom, Shalom, meaning peace. So you understand what he's doing here. He's showing you that 
his name Melchizedek means he's the king of righteousness. And he's the king of Shalem. Ur Shalem. Shalem. Shalem, right? Mm -hmm. The name of <clears throat> Jerusalem, the ancient name of Jerusalem. Shalem, Shalem, Ur Shalem, right? I'm just trying to pronounce it as a Syrian Hebrew. Shalem, Shlama, Shalom, Shalem, Shalom, Shlomo, right? So point being, his names are significant. What's the point? The point is that even his names are significant. Melchizedek, king of righteousness. King of Salem, Ur Shalem. Ur means city of Shalem, Jerusalem, which at that time was called Shalem, Shalem. You know, Shalem, Shalem, Shlomo, Shalom, same root. Peace. So he's the king of peace. He's the king of righteousness. Now, the point of the author of Hebrews is this. If you're listening, let me know if they're listening. Because yeah. if you're not listening, you're not learning. And if you're not learning, you won't grow and you won't be able to share this. The point Hebrews is making is that these names are deliberate. The story of Melchizedek is deliberately told in this way. Meaning, when the Holy Spirit inspired the author, we believe Moses wrote it. When the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write about Melchizedek, he was guided by the Spirit to write the story of Melchizedek in such a way as to leave the readers in suspense and to, to portray him, depict him as a mysterious figure because we don't know much about him. His story is found in Genesis 14, 18 to 20. You can read all the way to 22, Genesis 14, 18 to 22. And then he's mentioned only one other time, Psalm 110, verse 4. So if you want to open up, go to Genesis 14, 18 to 22. Okay. Genesis 14, 18 to 22. Then Melchizedek, king of Salam, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God. You most catch high. what he did? Mm -hmm. He brings out bread and wine. He's a priest. He's a king. He's a priestly king, a royal priest, meaning he offers sacrifices to God. He also blesses the people of God. So he's a priestly king, a royal priest. And notice what he does. He brings out bread and wine. You see how this is meant to be a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Christ, our Lord, on the night of his betrayal, instituted the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. And he brought out bread and wine and said, the bread is his body that is broken. And the wine, the cup is his blood that is shed. So are you seeing how already in hindsight, in light of the New Testament revelation, Melchizedek is being depicted as a picture of a greater one. He's a shadow of the reality to come. So keep and, reading. And he blessed them and said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave them a tithe of all. Now, now here you're not told who gave a tithe to who. He gave him a tithe of all. But it's implied that Abraham is giving Melchizedek a tithe because you give your tithes to God and by extension to the priest who stands in the place of God. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. So you see. So who gave who a tenth, a tithe? Yeah, Abraham gave Melchizedek, who stands in the place of God, a tithe. Because the tenth is given to God, right? Exactly. But how does God receive the tenth? You give it to his priest. Exactly. So we know it's Abraham giving Melchizedek the tithe because he's giving it to God through the priest who represents God. Amen. And this Melchizedek is great. He not only blesses Abraham, he blesses God. Hmm. Right? Correct. He blessed both Abraham and God, right? Yes. And Abraham recognizes his status because Abraham allows him to bless him because Abraham's recognizing his God is my God. The God he worships is the God I worship, and he's the priest of my God because he doesn't extend that same honor to the king of Sodom. Right. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to Jehovah, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. You read all the way to 22, right? Yep. All right. So Abraham does not do what the king of Sodom asks. He rejects him. 
whereas he honors Melchizedek by giving him a tithe, a tenth, and he allows Melchizedek to bless him in the name of God, possessor of heaven and earth, acknowledging that Melchizedek's God is his God. They worship the same God and that he's a priest of his God. So are we seeing all this? I guys want you to see this. Yep, we're with Moreover, you. Moreover, this is long before the Mosaic Law, right? Right. And already before the Mosaic Law, the people of God already know of and are observing tithing. That doesn't mean New Testament, New Covenant, we tithe. I'm just showing you what many people fail to realize. A lot of the laws found in Moses were laws already known and observed and practiced by the people of God before Moses, but then later codified and made part of the law of Moses. Here's an example. Abraham is giving a tithe, a tenth, to God through Melchizedek. To Melchizedek and through him to God. So they already know about tithing. Everyone got it? Right. But he's not the only one. Even Jacob in Genesis 28, 10 to 22, specifically Genesis 28, 10 to 22, if you read 18 to 22, he makes a vow. Can you read verse 22, Genesis 28, 22? And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So Jacob is also observing the tithe, the tenth? 100%. So you see a lot of the laws later codified by Moses, 400 years later, were already known and observed by the people of God because God had already made it known. Because even Abraham knew about burnt offerings. When God tells Abraham to offer his only begotten son, whom he loves, as a burnt offering, God doesn't have to explain to Abraham what a burnt offering is. Right? Or in Genesis 8, 20 to 21, Noah comes out of the flood, out of the ark after the flood. He builds an altar and he sacrifices clean animals and birds as a burnt offering to God. Are we seeing this? Yes. So what are we learning? We're learning that many of these laws already in practice, already known, already observed, that later became codified by Moses, even circumcision. That was given to Abraham before Moses, but then it's reiterated by Moses in the Mosaic Covenant. Another practice you'll see, which is amazing. I need you guys to listen. The Leveret Law. If you go to Deuteronomy 25, you don't need to go there. Verses 5 to 10. Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 to 10. There we're told that if Someone marries a woman and dies childless. His brother must come and marry his widow and sire a child to preserve his life. Well, that law is already known in Genesis 38. Because remember Judah, his son Ur and Onan, where God struck them down because they're evil. So one son married a woman, but God struck him down. He had no child. And then his brother married her, but he didn't want to get her pregnant so that his brother would not have a child to preserve his lineage so he did coitus interruptus he pull out and god struck him dead that's the deliberate law being observed in genesis 38 right everyone's seeing this right mm -hmm. okay so i just wanted to share that because we want to go as deep as we can trusting the spirit illuminate us and correct all my mistakes and sins for the glory of the father of the spirit now coming to the issue if you guys are listening already melchizedek is someone astounding Someone mysterious, someone perplexing. Why? He shows up out of nowhere. Genesis 14, 18 to 20. Melchizedek blesses Abraham. And Abraham recognized Melchizedek is greater than him and a priest of the true God. Because Abraham would not allow Melchizedek to bless him if he wasn't a priest of the God of Abraham. And then moreover, Melchizedek brings out bread and wine. And Melchizedek means kings of righteousness, king of Salem, king of peace. Uru Shalem, Shalem, Shalom, Shalem, right? Already we see something amazing, amazing, mysterious about Melchizedek. And the only other time he's mentioned is in Psalm 110, verse 4. Read that for me. Okay, Psalm 110, <clears throat> verse 4 it says. One second before we do that. Hold on. Sure. Let me do this one. Go to my live stream. I'm live right now. Tell me if you see me because I'm going to show you my black shirt. Okay. Let me know. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Psalm 110.4. 
Jehovah has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So notice, this is the second reference to Melchizedek. Not much is told about him. Why is he a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek? Melchizedek, ha Melchizedek has a priestly order? Why? Melchizedek blesses Abraham, and Abraham recognizes that Melchizedek, priest of the God that he worships. Why? We're not told. Does everyone see the pattern here? And Hebrews, which we believe is influenced by Paul, tradition says Paul wrote it most likely through an amanuensis, a secretary. It's Pauline. In fact, you'll even find copies where you find the Pauline corpus in Hebrews is ascribed to Paul. Even in the King James Bible, you'll see it's the epistle written by St. Paul. So a long tradition that says Paul wrote this, most likely through a scribe, amanuensis. And some people believe actually Luke wrote it because the Greek of Hebrews is polished. It's of a high quality, and it's comparable to the Greek of Luke and Acts. So some actually believe Luke wrote Luke and Acts and Hebrews. Now, why am I belaboring the point? Because I want to try to be as accurate as I can by the grace of the Holy Spirit anointing me to recall the facts. Because I want you to see what Hebrews is seeing. I want you to see what the Jews who composed the Dead Sea Scrolls saw. This Melchizedek is a mysterious, glorious, mind-blowing figure. Because not only does he bless Abraham, the physical progenitor of the covenant people. So when a Jew sees that my ancestor gave a tithe to this Melchizedek, my ancestor, who is the friend of God, whom God made a covenant with, and through his seed all nations will be blessed, acknowledge the greatness of this priest by allowing him to bless him in recognition that his God is the God of my ancestor. And then Psalm 110 says that the anointed king will be a priest in his order, not from the Levitical order. Who is this Melchizedek? Okay, now hold on. I got to do something. Okay, you see now, let me know if you're getting feedback. Do you understand the mystery? Okay, now watch me, Yusuf, my black shirt. And be <laughs> honest, Yusuf, because you're going to have to confess. Watch, Yusuf. Watch me, Yusuf. Yusuf, watch me. Look. Watch me, Yusuf. Look, Yusuf. Look, Yusuf. Do you see, Yusuf? Look. Black shirt, Yusuf. Do you see? Yusuf, watch me. Look. Black shirt, Yusuf. How do I look now, Yusuf, when the camera adds 15 pounds? Okay. Anyway, so I'm doing anyway, guys. Sorry. Haters. All right. Now, what's the feedback? All right. They're catching it. So you see the mystery. What's the answer? Why is he presented this way? Well, Hebrews comes and tells you why. Now we get the inspired explication, interpretation. Of why Melchizedek is portrayed as this glorious, mysterious being, majestic being. Understand how great he is. He's so great, he's greater than Abraham. He's so great, Abraham gives him a tenth in recognition that this is the priest of the God of Abraham and by extension, the God of Israel. He's so great that the anointed king will be a priest in his order. And that's all we're told of him. Genesis 14, 18, 20, Psalm 110, 4. Now comes the answer. If you don't believe the New Testament, then this is not going to make sense. The New Testament clearly teaches the entirety of the Old Testament, the entirety of the Hebrew Bible, designed, inspired by the Spirit, to point to the Lord Jesus Christ, his person and his work and his church, as well as pointing to his coming in glory to establish God's kingdom on earth. But if you don't believe the New Testament and you reject the New Testament, then you're left with a mystery in Genesis and Psalm 110. You didn't answer. You didn't answer my question, Yusuf. Do I look like I used to, Yusuf? Sorry, it's a guy I'm playing with. Anyway, everyone with me there? We're with you. Without the New Testament, you can't answer these questions. That's why the Jews are perplexed. Do you understand? Let me go really deep into this topic. You understand that this perplexed the Jews to such an extent that there is a scroll that was found. You guys have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
the Dead Sea Scrolls found 1947. They found a scroll from the 11th cave. These are in the Dead Sea area, in the Qumran caves. And in cave 11, they found a scroll talking about Melchizedek. It's called 11Q Melchizedek, translated in English. And I wrote an article on it. And I also not only wrote an article on it, but I did a session on it. So I'm going to show you it in a minute. In this scroll, the Jews identify Melchizedek as the second divine power. So how deep you want me to go into this topic? As the spirit leads you, brother. We have nothing but time as long as you have time. People listening. Do you want me to go real deep? Because I'm going to show the article in a minute. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's do it. Okay. In the scroll, Melchizedek is identified as the second divine power. Because a lot of people may not know this. Because modern Judaism seeks to deny it. But scholars are aware of this. There was a large segment of Jews before, during, even after the time of Christ that believed in two powers in heaven, two divine powers, Yahweh and a second power. That second power was variously called Son of Man, Angel of Yahuwah. And in this scroll, he's identified as Melchizedek. In this scroll, Psalm chapter 7, verses 7 to 8, is ascribed to Melchizedek. And Psalm 110 is ascribed to Melchizedek and Isaiah 52, 7. Now, why is that astonishing? Psalm 7, 78, it's about Yahweh judging. And this scroll identifies Melchizedek as the Yahweh who comes to judge. Psalm 82 is a psalm about God judging the gods, the sons of God, and striking them dead. The scroll identifies Melchizedek as the God who strikes down those corrupt gods, those wicked sons of God, in judgment, and they identify the gods and the sons of God, who this God strikes down, as Belial and his angels, meaning Satan and his angels, and Melchizedek will strike him down, and his angels will strike down the angels of Belial, the king of evil. And on top of that, Melchizedek is said to come about and bring about the atonement for the people of God, because he's a priest. <laughs> okay, Yusuf, take it easy, buddy. So you see that, right? All right. <clears throat> all right. Everyone got it? Yep. Now, where am I getting this all from? From that scroll. Now, let me screen share, because I know you need attention. You need attention? Always. Here's Here's... Here it is, folks. Let my article, and I'll bring you up in a minute. Here it is. All right, here. You're going to go to my article section, answeringislam.info. I hope you guys are enjoying this. I'm wired. I can't sleep. That means I'll probably be up till eight in the morning. <laughs> I'm worried. I can't sleep. I don't know what the hell happened to me. I'm drinking coffee right now, so you're, you're in good company. Here you go. Mel Kezarek. So what you're going to do, let me show you. You guys on TikTok, you're going to go to answeringislam.info. You're going to go to individual authors. I don't know why I keep saying that. When you go to individual authors, you're going to see Sam Shamoon. Shamoon like baboon. <laughs> How dare you? All the way here. Do I need to make it a little larger? You guys can see. You and... TikTok and YouTube, can you see, or did they, they need me to make it a little larger? Well, TikTok, they're not able to see it. Oh, they're losers, then. Yeah. All right. Guys, should, is it large enough, or should I make it larger? Large enough? All right. It's good. Okay, they say it's good. So then what you do is, this is the link to all my articles, but you scroll down to the bottom. Look how many articles. I have, I think, over 2,000 articles on my blog and here. Download them, save them, use them, learn them, share them. You go here to the former index page. So let me enlarge this. So you're going to have to pass the links to them or have them come and watch the YouTube session. So yeah. far, the feedback on your TikTok, they're getting this? Absolutely, they are. Okay, so then they won't be able to see the article. Melchizedek, the Dead Sea Scrolls and God's Uniplurality, some observations on Melchizedek. So I'm going to send it to you in private chat and you send it on TikTok. Here it is. Look at your private chat. Right Unf there. Unfortunately, I can't do that either. TikTok, yeah, right. they don't allow for that. All right, then you TikTokers, you're gonna have to come to the YouTube and get the article. But anyway, 
Mm. Here it is. I quote two English versions of the Melchizedek scroll. And you're going to see he's identified as Yahweh God of Psalm 778 right here. And he's identified as God of Psalm 82, verse 1, right here. And he's also considered, some say he's not the anointed messenger, meaning the Messiah, but anointed messenger will announce the coming of Melchizedek as the God who reigns. So he's called the God your, the reigns. So Melchizedek said, your God reigns, right? They're right there. And he makes atonement. All this said about Melchizedek. Now, if people are understanding the point, and I go through this thoroughly and I break down implication, this means that there were Jews who believed Melchizedek was actually the second divine power who appeared as man on earth and went back to heaven. Do you see the point? Yes. This is how confusing Melchizedek was to the Jews. Now, later rabbinic Judaism, later Jews after time of Christ, later rabbinic Judaism identified Melchizedek as who? Do you know? As the Messiah, right? No. No. Do you, you don't know? It's okay. You don't know? No, I don't know. Shem, the son of Noah. Oh, really? Yep. Later rabbinic Judaism said this was Shem, the son of Noah, who was still alive when Abraham was alive. And that's why Abraham acknowledged him, because it was Shem. But the Jews who produced the Dead Sea Scroll says, no, he's a divine being. He's Elohim, identified with God, who appears as a man and goes back and will come again, right, to then destroy Belial and his angels and to make atonement for the people of God. So when you say later Jews, you mean like after Christ, right? The rabbinic Jews, buddy. Yeah, rabbinic Jews, gotcha. What I said, you little sinner. <laughs> You're not little anymore. You're a large sinner now. Right? Literally, man. But you got you see it, right? Everyone got it now? Yeah. Okay. What does this mean? It means the Jews were baffled by Genesis 14, 18 to 20, and baffled by Psalm 110, verse 4. They didn't know what to make of Melchizedek. But because we believe Jesus Christ, our Lord, is God, who died and rose again, who lives, and he poured out the Holy Spirit on his apostles and their companions, and the Spirit moved them to write the New Testament, to accurately interpret the Old Testament, we now get the answer. Now we're going to go back to Hebrew 7. Okay, now read for me Hebrew 7, Mr. <clears throat> All right, from 1? Yep, read verses 1 to 3. Okay. For this Melchizedek... King of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated King of Righteousness, and then also King of Salem, meaning King of Peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now, here's the article I wrote on the meaning of Hebrews 7.3. Here it is. Now, if you guys are on TikTok, you're not going to see the link. It's on my YouTube. And for those of you, I'm sending it to you in the chat right there. This is the article. This is one of my older articles because this question keeps coming up. See, well, how many persons of the Godhead are there? Four? Melchizedek, right? So I had to write an article on this years ago. How do I know Melchizedek is not Jesus, contrary to what people say? Because, guys, please don't be stubborn. Don't add to Scripture. Here's how I know. The word, but resembling Son of God, the word resembling, aphomoi ominos, aphomoi ominos, aphomoi ominos, okay? Comes from aphomoi o, resembling, made to look like, a copy of. If you go to your Greek lexicon, and if you like Strong's, the Strong will tell you that this word, aphomoio, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, you're seeing it on screen, it means to cause a model to pass off into an image or shape like it, to express itself in it, to copy, to produce a facsimile, to be made like, render similar. The word shows that Melchizedek cannot be the Son of God because he's made like the Son of God. He's made a copy of the Son of God. He's a facsimile of the Son of God. 
That means he's not the son of God, right? Correct. So that's why Jesus is the prototype with Melchizedek being the type. That's how I know he's not the son because he's resembling the son. He's a facsimile of the son. He's a type of the son. The son is the prototype. Melchizedek is the shadow and Christ is the reality. Okay, now to further prove Melchizedek is not Jesus in his preeminent existence, read Hebrews 7 15. <clears throat> and it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest. So, who is the one who comes in the likeness of Melchizedek? The Messiah, Jesus. because it tells you in verse 14 that our Lord came from Judah, a right. tribe which Moses said nothing about priests, right? Right. So in Hebrews 7 15, Jesus is what? Read it again. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest. So if Christ is in the likeness of Melchizedek, he's another priest. That means he's not Melchizedek, the priest. Exactly. Is everyone getting it before I move on? Yep. The person who asks, is he getting it? Uh, he hasn't commented, but I'm sure he's watching. Okay, but here's the issue now. What's the issue? We only know that we, we know there's only one high priest in heaven, Jesus. Read the book of Hebrews. Read Hebrews 4. From 14 to 16. Read Hebrews 9. Read from 12 to 28. Read Hebrews 7 all the way to the end. You'll see that it is Christ and Christ alone who entered the most holy place before the Father's presence as the high priest, and he sits at the right side of the throne. There is no other high priest. There's only one. Everyone get it? Does it as there's only one. Correct. Only Christ is high priest in heaven. Only Christ entered the most holy place of heaven. Only Christ is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high, next to the Father, beholding the Father's face, presenting his blood before the Father's presence. He alone is there as high priest. That right there tells you that the author of Hebrews does not mean what he says literally. You understand? Right. If you read Hebrews in context, he shows you Melchizedek is not literally a high priest who is still serving because where is he serving? At the time of the writing, the temple was there and it was a Levitical priest serving in the temple in Jerusalem. No Melchizedek. And he just told you that in heaven, Jesus is the high priest. He's the one who's gone behind the veil, who is sitting on the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, next to the Father as our high priest, not Melchizedek. Does everyone get it? Well, correct, right. With you. Do they get it? Yes. So that means if Hebrew shows you Melchizedek is not there in heaven with Jesus, and he's not on earth in Jerusalem, because at that time it's the Levitical priesthood, they're the ones serving the temple in Jerusalem, then he expects you to understand he's not speaking literally. In other words, he's trusting that you guys know how to read and read contextually and read accurately that you'll know this is not literal. Because if he meant it literally, that means he'd show somewhere in his book that there are two high priests in heaven, Melchizedek and Jesus. But there's only one, and it's Jesus. Okay, did everyone get it? Right. Yes. If we got it, now I can unpack his point. Okay. Can we unpack his point? Absolutely. His point is there's nothing in Scripture that wasn't deliberately placed there by design. The Spirit deliberately moved Moses and David to describe Melchizedek in such a way as leaving us with the impression that he's not merely human. Because number one, we're not told that he was born. We're not told that he died, we're not told his race, we're not told his ethnicity, we're not told of his parentage, all left out. And then in Psalm 110.4, we're told there's a priesthood in his order. 
and is lying. Why? These details were left out in order to present Melchizedek as an eternal divine person appearing as a man, having no beginning and no end because he's uncreated and he never dies in order to point to the one who really is all those things. In other words, the point of Hebrews 7.3 is to show Jesus is really, in reality, what Melchizedek is simply a shadow of. It is the Son who's uncreated, beginningless, whose years never die. And as God, he has no human progenitors and remains forever a priest. That's the point of Hebrews 7.3. Amen. Amen. In other words, it's one of the strongest proof texts that Christ is beginningless, uncreated. His years never end, which is exactly what he said in Hebrews 1, 8 to 12 about Jesus. So go to Hebrews 1, 8 to 12. That's the meaning. Everyone got the meaning or I put them asleep? Nope. You got it. <clears throat> With the exception of, uh, of a donkey. Steve-O. Don't straw man, or you're gonna get muted and kicked out of here for being. Oh, I'm gonna get this shit. I'm on your mother again. <laughs> yeah. Hebrews right. one eight to twelve. But to the Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions and you lord in so the now beginning don't forget emphasize it's the father speaking to the son about the son and now notice the father says to the son in hebrews 1 10 to 12 what he says to the son you lord in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands so the father says to jesus you're the lord you laid the foundation of the earth. You made the heavens by your own hands, which is a metaphor by your own power. And what else? They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. Okay. Did everyone see Jesus literally has no beginning because he was there before creation. He's the one who created the heavens and the earth and everything in creation. He's the one who's sustaining creation, preserving creation, changing creation. And like creation, he doesn't change, remains the same. Exactly. So he's already told you in Hebrews 1, Jesus is uncreated. Jesus is beginningless. Jesus brought the entire creation to being, sustains it by his powerful word. That's Hebrews 1, 3. Changes it, transforms it. And yet he remains the same, years never end. So what is said about Melchizedek is true of Christ. Melchizedek is presented as if he's eternal. But in reality, he's presented that way because he's a picture of the one who is eternal. That's all. And even in the worst case scenario, let's say this heathen, this brain ass doesn't want to accept it. He wants to say, no, no, Melchizedek is literally eternal and created. Then all you prove is that's the Holy Spirit. What do I mean? Even at worst, even if you don't accept my expectation uh, explanation, this doesn't mean there's a fourth person in the Godhead because this would mean that Melchizedek is the Holy Spirit because there are three uncreated persons in the Godhead. Mm -hmm. So since Melchizedek is not the Father, he's not the Son, that means you're left with the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit who appeared as a man who resembles the Son because the Son and the Spirit are inseparable and they mimic one another's functions and deeds. So at worst case, you're only proving it's Holy Spirit. So either way, you don't get a fourth person in the Godhead. And by the way, do people want me to prove that the Holy Spirit, though not the Son and separate from the Son, and mimics and does the deeds and the functions the Son carries out? You guys want me to show you that? Well, I know I do. It looks like people are saying yes right away. So, okay. How many intercessors we have? We have two. Go to Romans 8 34. Watch. Let me show you. Okay. Romans 8 34. Yep. Who, who is he who condemns? 
It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Okay, so who makes intercession for us? The Son. The Son, right? But now read Romans 8, 26 to 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now notice, like Jesus, the Holy Spirit, this Holy Spirit intercedes for us and through us. But now notice the other connection. So they're both intercessors. One physically in heaven at the right hand of the Father and one with us interceding for us and through us. But now watch the other proof that Jesus and the Spirit, though not the same person, distinct and inseparable, carry out the same functions and perform the same deeds. Not always because the Spirit did not become flesh, but in these aspects. Here, John 14, 16 to 17. Now you guys can see it on the screen, right? But you read it. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. Now, notice, before you move on, his translation says helper. That's okay. It can be translated helper, advocate, comforter, counselor. The key verse is another. The word another in Greek is alos. It's the accusative of alos, alon. Alon means another of the same kind. Another of the same kind. So if you read your Greek here, John 14, 16, it's alon perikliton. Another paraclete. Perikletas. Perikliton. Paraclete can be rendered helper, comforter, counselor, advocate. And it's another of the same kind. Alon, accusative of alos. The other word, Homos means another of the same kind, right? But then you have another word, heteros, another of a different kind. Homos, same. Alos, same. Heteros, different. And you'll see it in English, heterosexual, a different kind of sex. Homosexual, the same kind of sex. So here, when John writes in Greek, he doesn't say heteron. Perikleton, a different kind of paraclete. He says, alone, alos, another of the same kind. Okay? Amen. So this paraclete is the same kind of paraclete as the other, because another means there's someone else besides him. Another means the Holy Spirit is not the only helper. There's another helper who is as the Spirit, because the Spirit is the same kind of helper as the other one. So there are at least two, right? Correct. Now read John 14, 16, 17 again. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Okay, now the question is, who is the other paraclete, parakletos, the other helper, counselor, the other advocate? Because Jesus says the Holy Spirit is another paraclete, meaning there's at least one other paraclete. And these two paracletes are of the same kind. They're not the same person. That's why he's another, but they're the same kind. You don't need to guess. John, who wrote the Gospel of John, wrote 1 John 2 1. Now you read it in your translation 1 John 2 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an helper with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Wait, helper with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Helper with the Father. That's the word parakletos. It's an accuser, parakleton. 
John 14, 16, I will pray the Father give you another helper. Now here, let me show you this translation. John 14, 16. Mine said, will, oh, sorry. What? My, oh, bless my, your face. <laughs> what do you need, dude? I was going to say, the New King James says advocate. I just changed it to helper to make it more understandable. Because you're a loser. John 14, 16, Legacy Standard Bible. I will ask the Father, he'll give you another advocate. Well, that's the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit in John 14, 26. Notice, we have an advocate. It's the same Greek word. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the parakletos with the Father, who at one time was with believers on earth. And the Holy Spirit is the other parakletos, who's now with the church. To show you it's the same word, I'm going to show you the Greek. Now, you got to be on YouTube to see it. Interlinear, Bible up, so you can see it's the same word. So do you catch it? Like Jesus, the Holy Spirit intercedes. Like Jesus, he guides, instructs, and teaches the church. Like Jesus, he is a helper and advocate. Therefore, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, though distinct, perform the same functions. Right? So here it is. Let's see the Greek. John 14, 6, right? In the Greek, alon perakliton. Right here, perakliton. You guys see it on the screen? Then we go to 1 John 2, 1. So all you're proving is that Melchizedek is the Holy Spirit. That's it. You're not proving it's a fourth person. But that's not the meaning. So even if you have that brain ass who wants to deny it, you're not proving a fourth person in the Godhead. Now watch 1 John 2, 1. What is Jesus? Parakliton, echomen, proston potera, Jesun Christun, dikaion. Parakliton. Jesus is the paraclete who was with believers on earth, now with the Father. And the Holy Spirit is the other paraclete who's with the church. I hope that answered the question. I don't know if it did. It did. You have anything else? Let's see. Bring them up if they want to come up, if they're not scared. It, it's funny. <clears throat> when it's a teaching session, we uh, you barely have anyone. But if it's a cooking session, you're going to have four or 500 people here. I told you that, man. Well, my son, we have about 450. But that's what I told you. When it's something controversial, come and challenge me. You should have done that. You should have said, hey, challenge. I thought you did that. To bring challenges on, mister. <laughs> you didn't title it challenge? Yeah, well, what else? I will next time. I just said with Sam. So let's see. With Sam, say, hey, come challenge. Stump the chump. Stump the chump. <laughs> okay, I, I do have, I do, I do have question in my inbox. So okay, what do they say? Okay. <clears throat> Stump the chump. My question. Hold on one second. My question was. My question, was Adam the first high priest and did the following lineage... Adam, the first high priest? Mm -hmm. Was Adam the first high priest and did the following lineage that Christ would come through would be in order of a priest? Could what is hmm? Adam, the first high priest, and the what will come through whose lineage? What is talking about? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, the Christ will come through would be an order of priests. Could Shem be the first order of the lineage of Christ because the former priest was washed away and Shem was the hey, are first? You, are you on crack or are you on meth? What are you doing? I mean, you sound like you're on drugs. What the hell are you talking about, Adam, the first high priest, and Shem was a priest? What is this guy talking about? Yeah, I'm not sure. So this is why I can't do it on off. Uh, I'm saying if he's on drugs, he needs to go to counseling. <laughs> and he needs to go to rehab because that sounds as as coherent as the Quran. I thought you were citing the Quran. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I couldn't do it. Well, where, where do you get that Shem is a high priest? I'm not sure, to be honest with you. If you read the scriptures clearly, not only do you have kings serving as priests, if you read your Old Testament, even in the pagan cultures, even among pagans, kings would serve as priests. But beyond that, you even find households serving as the priests for their house. For example, Abraham, as the head of his house, would build altars and offer sacrifices 
on his behalf and his family behalf, right? Where everyone he would build altars like Genesis 12, 8, Genesis 21, 33. Right. So that means the head of the house would function as the priest on behalf of his household, praying and interceding for himself and his family to God. And you find that in Job. Job was the priest of his household. Why? Because if you open up Job 1, 4 to 5, when his children would celebrate their birthdays, what would he do? Just in case they sinned against a God by partying it up too much. Job 1, 4 to 5. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day. Birthday, right? Uh-huh. So here you find in the Bible, even in ancient times, they celebrated the birthday of a person. Right? And we, correct. And you're highlighting that because of the J-dubs. And no, they, they use this actually to show you that birthdays are evil. Oh, really? Okay. Because they'll say, see, birthdays are evil because Job had to offer sacrifices because there was a possibility they were sinning by getting drunk and, you know, parting it up too much. That's one of the texts they use to show no birthdays. Uh -huh. Go ahead. <clears throat> and would send an invite their three sisters, to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did regularly. So did you see what Job did? Being the head of the house, he would then offer burnt offerings to atone for their sins in case they they partied too much, got so drunk, they disgraced themselves and sinned against the Lord to atone for their sins. But notice Job, not only is functioning priest, but he already knows about burnt offerings. Right? What did he offer? Exactly. Burnt offerings. How did he know about that? He didn't have the Mosaic Law. Exactly. The law must have been passed long before the Mosaic Law. God had already revealed this. Now, not only there, but when God restores Job and explains to Job and then strengthens Job and restores his blessing, before he does that, he rebukes his three unwise friends headed by Eliphaz. And now notice what God has Job do for them. Go to Job 42, 7 to 10, but you're going to read 7 to 12. <clears throat> and so it was after Jehovah had spoken these words to Job, that Jehovah said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of the Temanite, Timon, that means he's an Edomite, a descendant of Esau, because that was the land as as ascribed to the descendants of Esau. So they're not an Israelite. Eliphaz is not an Israelite, right? Right. You hear that? Yeah. Hebrew Israelites? Okay. My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Yep. Now, therefore, take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams. Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept him lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Nemethite, went and did as Jehovah commanded them. For Jehovah had accepted Job, and Jehovah restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, Jehovah gave Job twice as much as he had before than all his brothers, all his sisters, all those who had been his acquaintances before came to him and ate food with him in his house. And they counseled him and comforted him for all the adversity that Jehovah had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and each a ring of gold. Now, Jehovah, how blessed long, how long, do, how long are you reading to when you told me to verse 12. Okay, just want to make sure because, man, you read very slow and you're torturing me. But go ahead. <laughs> Good. Go ahead. Now, Jehovah blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. 
All right. Now, did you see he wrote Job 42, 7 and 12? If you're paying attention, what did God have Job do? Intercede for them. Now, mm -hmm. you Protestants need to learn the depth of Scripture, beauty of Scripture. I want you to pay attention, Protestants. You who love the Lord, love the Trinity, love Scripture. Listen. God is speaking to them directly because God is appearing visibly. God says, you better take seven bulls and rams, offer them as burnt offering, and have my servant Job pray for you. Then I'll forgive you. When you tell me, why do I need to go to a priest and confess my sins? I can just go to God directly. You're, here's your answer. Why did God have them complicate matters, take seven rams, seven bulls, and have Job then pray for them? And only then God forgive them. Why not just go directly to God, offer the sacrament of God, and just have God for, forgive them on the spot? Why complicate it? Do you see that there? Absolutely. But now I want you to see something deeper. Because the three friends had falsely accused Job, saying that you must have sinned against God, shame God for God to punish you and afflict you. And Job said, no, I didn't. So they were wrong. Now, lest Job be bitter in his heart towards them. Lest Job have some animosity in his heart towards them because they turn out to be wicked, miserable counselors who falsely accused him. Falsely accused him. And he turned out to be right and vindicated. Lest Job continue having hate in his heart. God has Job pray for them. Now, notice the deeper significance of praying for them. Reread Job 42, 10 to 12. <clears throat> and Jehovah restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. When did he restore his losses? When he prayed for his friends. So read that entire verse again before I cut you off. Verse 10. And Jehovah restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, Jehovah gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now, what are you learning from here? The fact that Job is praying for his friends is healing. See, God, who is perfect in wisdom and knows what's best for us, he's healing Job. How? If there's any resentment and bitterness in his heart, the only way God will accept Job's prayer if Job is praying from his heart out of true concern for his friends. Because if it's a prayer that's not from the heart and it's vain, it won't be accepted. So God is using Job's prayer to heal his heart, to have no animosity, but truly forgive and love his friends. This is why the more you pray for your enemy, the more your heart will be softened towards them. And this is where I'm guilty. I don't pray for my ex-wife. I pray for God's discipline on her. This is why I have bitterness towards her. Because of what she did to my family. Had I been praying from my heart that God save her, then that would then heal my heart to want what's best for her and have no animosity. Because the only way God could hear that prayer is if I mean it from my heart. You Amen. see, you see the wisdom of God here? Amen. I remember you taught me this years ago. Yep. But this is the wisdom of God. Sam Job can't. Cannot pray. I know you need attention. Hold on, bro. Go, Job cannot pray from his heart sincerely for the forgiveness of his friends if he has bitterness and hatred towards them because that prayer will not be accepted. You see? Amen. What did you want to say? I wanted to say something to a couple of Protestant brothers and sisters say, that said that, oh, Jesus fulfilled that. Now we have access to the throne of grace. But what do you do? Oh, wait, wait, wait. You mean... James 5, 13 and 16 mm. contradicts Jesus. Fulfill that, you Protestant butchers. See, this is why you're disgusting and you're filthy because you think you know the Bible because the same New Testament says that you are to go to the elders and confess your sin. But wait, Jesus fulfilled that. Why go to the elders? Yeah, see, no matter what the Bible says, you've made up your mind because you're perverts like the Muslims. You have no respect for the Bible. Thank God not all Protestants are like you Bible butchers. Mm. But anyway. And would you also say Mark chapter 2, 1 through 5, the intercession of the four? No, they'll say, well, that was Jesus on earth. They went to Jesus. Okay. Yeah, because they think they're smart and slick. Yeah, but James James knocks it out of the park, though. Yeah, because there it says, 
summon the elders to anoint the person who's sick with the oil. And if he sin and he confesses his sin, right, he'll be restored. Sam, a while back, you also said the wisdom behind that is here you have people paying for psychologists hundreds of hours, right? Yeah. No, but that, that is. Satan is a great mimicker. He mimics the things of God. Okay, so he's asking me this. How do you know confession is ordained by God? Because number one, scriptural. I'm not making it up. It's in the Bible. It's not just in James 5. It's also in other texts. So that's not the topic here. And it's historical. You go to your earliest Christian sources. The earliest Christian writings. And challenge me on this, Protestants. Prove me wrong. The very disciples of the apostles, appointed by the apostles as bishops and their successors, unbroken chain. Prove me wrong. Go ahead. I challenge you. I dare you. If you're men and women of conviction, prove me wrong. You will find the universal unanimous practice of Christians coming to confess their sins to the leaders before they could take the Eucharist. Unanimous, universal. Prove me wrong. All right. So let's put that aside. Another proof that confessing to a human appointed by God, not everyone's qualified. Those who are truly appointed by God, filled with the Spirit. May we practice what we preach. Right? That God has ordained this, so there's accountability. And then there will be counseling and nurturing. Because if you go straight to God, you're accountable to no one because no one knows what you're struggling with. And secondly, there won't be anyone to then be used of God to practically provide for your needs because no one knows about your circumstance. How does God provide? Through his church. Well, let's say you're in financial need. Well, if you don't tell it to the church, then how can God then use the church to meet your need? That's just one example. So this accountability is for, number one, that you don't go and sin and hide it and thinking, well, it's between me and God, so that you can keep on hiding your sin because I'm confessing and think you can get away with it. No, because when you now confess to someone whom you're accountable to, now you have to answer to him and you're not free to do what you want. And none of us like that. We don't want to be accountable. Let's be honest. None of us like that. Amen. But when you do it God's way, now you have the person appointed over your life, whether it's your pastor. Now he's aware of your struggle. Now he's going to be checking in on you. He's going to be holding accountable because that's his job. And he can't just let you off the hook and let you free to do what you want. Accountability. And I'm going to show you how Satan mimics it. I'm going to show it to you. You guys who've suffered drug addiction, alcohol, drugs, you're going to see how this is right. Watch. Listen how deep it gets. Moreover, the second aspect is now the church, the elder knows your need and knows how to be used of God to then administer the things you need practically to escape. But now let's come back. Let me show you how this is confirmed by secular Western medicine. Okay. You guys, if you've been in drugs or drug rehab, tell me if I'm wrong. Is it a coincidence you have people who go see psychiatrists, psychologists on a weekly basis, spend an hour and pay money, and all they're doing is confessing? Why? If confessing to someone qualified and bona fide and trained wasn't something beneficial, wasn't something necessary in your healing and growth why the hell do you have the whole world recommending you to psychologists or psychiatrists because this is satan's way of keeping away from god's way of being healed so he's replaced confession with the psychiatrist go see your psychiatrist go sit on a couch pay him a hundred dollars an hour and confess to him go see your counselor did your people on TikTok get it? <clears throat> yeah. The second proof that confession is biblical from God, not only in scripture, but historically, the universal teaching of the church. But Satan knows it and he mimics it. You guys who've been into, like, say, drug rehab or, or an alcoholic problem, is it what, double A, triple A? Is it triple A? What is it called? AA, Alcoholic Anonymous. When you go there, 
Aren't you assigned an accountability partner that he has to check on you and he has to call you and that you have to then call in your time of need and confess when you're struggling? Where the hell do you think that came from? A sponsor. Thank you. Where the hell do you think that came from? Because Satan has replaced the church. Satan has replaced the priests and confession and accountability with his own priests, psychiatrists, psychologists, sponsors. And you Protestants think you're being biblical, but you're blind. Not all Protestants. I'm not saying all of you. Those of you who keep barking, thinking you know sola scriptura, tota scriptura. <clears throat> Yeah, and may I also say something, right, to the idiot that say, Albi, do you agree with Sam or disagree? Well, first of all, I want to say I agree. Second of all, even if I disagree, I'll sit at this man's feet and shut my mouth and listen until the Lord brings me home or brings him home. He's my blessing, my spiritual father. When he speaks, I shut up and I learn. So with that being said, what do you do then with you going to your pastor's and confessing your sins or like to Sam and my pastor, I confess my sins as well. Yeah, Hebrews right. 7, and right, Sam, Hebrews 7 and 17. How are they going to rule over you if they don't know anything about you? Yep. Uh, liberty. It's found in First Timothy chapter 3, verses 1, all the way to 13. Titus chapter 1, verses 5, all the way to 16. It's found in Scripture, the qualifications. It's there. The Bible gives you qualification. In fact, I'm going to call out a lot of you. How many of you have reached out to me in private, wanting to confess your sins to me, seeking my advice? How many of you Protestants have reached out to a friend and called out, wanting to be accountable, confess your sin, seeking help? You are instinctively proving that this is biblical and ordained by God. But you, in your hatred for the ancient churches, you will do anything to oppose what you even know to be written in your heart, God's law written in your heart. How many of you Protestants have reached out to friends, calling, wanting to cry to them, confess to them, asking for help and guidance? So now you're being the hypocrites. You're being the hypocrites. You're being liars because that's God's law written in your heart to convict you. You can't escape the truth. So here you go, brother. God bless you and preserve you. And may the spirit fill you and never fall again, crisscross. You see, recovering out in Sam, you are 100% correct. Do you, do you not see this is Satan mimicking what is of God, ordained by God, because he doesn't want you to go to God and his ordained ministers? He wants you to go to his priest, the secular priest, the psychologist, the psychiatrist, the counselors. And instead of taking the Lord's Supper as your healing, you take their prescription drugs. Okay. There you go. I hope that answered the question anyway. Well, the question was about Job being a priest mm -hmm. anyway and how the head of families were priests and so on. What's the next question? Sandra, you're good. Uh, as far as Petra sales, you're going to get muted because any Protestant that comes here or Catholic or whatever wants to cause division is going to get muted. I don't care. I don't care what you are. So if you're a Protestant and want to cause division, get the hell out of here. Same yep. goes to anybody. And just to let you know, Protestant, you don't demonize me. I've defended Protestants, and I've actually had Alby mute and throw out a Catholic just a couple of days ago who was insinuating Protestants are not Christians. You remember that? I recorded it on my session. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't tolerate that. So that's why I said some Protestants, because Protestants misunderstand. When I speak generally, I don't mean everyone. I've said there are garbage can, low lives, dogs in every field of Christianity. There are some vile, nasty Orthodox from vile, nasty Catholics, and I ran into them. But now I'm talking to the Protestants because you keep hammering sola scriptura, tota scriptura, and you think you know the scripture to condemn these practices as unbiblical. That only shows you don't know the scriptures as well as you think. Humble yourself and God will exalt you. Exalt yourself and God will humble you. Amen. Anyway, what's the next question, brother? Amen. Okay, let's bring up. You see now why the spirit is moving in this session? Look at this, brother. Look what he said. Hmm. Just brought tears to my eyes. Thank you, Sam. Because see, he's a recovering addict. He just saw the light switch. Wow. Because he just saw what I said. Uh, yeah, my brother Chris Cross. That's from he's from uh, TikTok. God bless him. God bless you, Chris. He may preserve you, brother. Okay, what's the next question? Okay, we're gonna bring up this young brother, Mikey. Mikey, let Mikey. 
Try it. He'll eat anything. Remember that commercial? You got to mute up. You got to mute up. You got to drop now. Damn. Yeah. All right. Let's bring up. All right, Mikey. Uh, I'm not doing it to be politically correct or tickle ears. I've said it. I'll say it again. Yes, I hate the five points of Calvinism. Yes, I do. Because I was a Calvinist. And I left it and I see the damage it did to me and others. Yes, I don't like Calvinism. But no, I've said it. I'll say it again. I'm not saying it because I want to tickle ears. You guys know that by now. There are true believers born of the Spirit who are Calvinists, but I don't think they're believers because of their Calvinism. There are true believers born of the Spirit who are Protestant evangelicals, love Jesus, filled with the Spirit, whom God is using mightily. And I can name some organizations to prove it. Jesus Film Project. Go and watch the testimonies, real-life miracles right now, documented right now that God is doing through them, right now. Because they go around show the Jesus film. It's a gospel Luke translated in many languages. Right now, they're evangelical. What I'm saying is, because I wanted to know the fullness of the truth, the more I studied, the more I saw that I could not remain Protestant. So if you are content where you're at, God meets you where you're at, sees your heart, and he meets you where you're at, and you'll be in heaven, and I pray I'm with you. That's my belief. I'm not saying it. To say it. That's what I've always believed. If I didn't think that, I wouldn't be working with Protestants. It's the Protestants that now think I'm a heretic, which is okay. I don't lose sleep over it. As long as you don't slander me and lie about me. Like you saw what that cow, Anthony Rogers, did when he lied about my situation. You're a witness to my situation. You've been it. You've seen it with your own eyes. But anyway, right. let's go to the question. Is there an echo? No, you're no, good. good. You're good. All right, God bless, uh, Brother Albie. Brother Sam, nice to finally meet you. Um, I do have a question. So I was speaking uh, to a respectful brother in humanity, and he brought slowly, up slowly, so, brother. You're speaking too fast. Slowly, you are speaking to a respectful brother in humanity. A, a Muslim, yes. Oh, so you said respect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Conversation, but um, so we both, or we all agree that uh, believing in the Trinity is essential for our salvation. Correct. It depends what you mean. It's not yes or no. Can you deny the Trinity and be a true Christian? No. But can there be Christians who are ignorant of the Trinity and still be saved and belong to Jesus? Absolutely. So if you're saying you must know the Trinity, you have hundreds of thousands of evangelicals, Catholics, Orthodox, who have no clue what the Trinity is. That's different from Someone who is presented with the evidence of the triune God and then rejects it as false. Now, that person's without excuse. Okay, that's a perfect explanation because I was going to go into um, it being established in the Council of Nicaea and then uh, with the. Who told you it's established in the Council of Nicaea? What was that? Who told you it was established there? Wasn't that when it, when all the Christian bishops came together and uh, that was like the first Are, time? Is the Muslim front affecting your brain cells? Are you like kissing the black stone? The Trinity was affirmed before the council convened and made it essential. So if I read to you the New Testament and the Old Testament, I read the writings of Ignatius and Polycarp and Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Irenaeus, and they're all affirming the Trinity. What in the world are you talking about? And they're all defending the Trinity against heresy such as modalism or adoptionism or Gnosticism long before Nicaea. What in the world are you talking about? Well, not to say that people didn't believe in it before the uh, first council of Nicaea, that the first, like, in a sense, an agreement towards, wouldn't that be like the first essential agreement? I don't know what you mean essential. You mean before they came to convene, the Orthodox bishops established by the apostles were in disagreement? What are you in the world are you talking about? I'm not too sure how to word it. Yeah, in other words, um, by asking question, I'm answering your, your question. No, it's not true that up until the Council of Nicaea, that the Christians who were the custodians of orthodoxy, meaning the true historic faith, bishops who were appointed by the apostles and their successors, did not agree on the fact that the God they worshipped is the Father, Son, and Spirit. They all agreed on that. This is why I can quote to you writings from different writers or bishops or fathers writing at different places, different times, and they're affirming the Trinity. 
So no, what the problem was is when the heretics, heretics came forward to present a different God, that caused the Christians now to respond to them and refute them in writing. So what Constantine wanted to do, now let me give you a history. Constantine claimed around 312 AD to see a sign, the sign of the cross. And he says, in this sign, conquer. And so he put crosses on the shields of the soldiers and he defeated the opposition. And he took that as the Christian God giving him victory. So then he made Christianity legal. At that time, it was illegal to be a Christian because he'd be killed or imprisoned, tortured, you name it. But then he saw that the Christians were opposed, opposed by heretics. And this was causing disunity in the empire and division. And he realized a divided empire cannot stand. This is why he con convened the council. Because he wanted now for all those professing Christianity to no longer fight each other, persecute each other, maim each other, or kill each other. Because if his empire is divided, it cannot stand. Mm -hmm. Let's come and agree on an official statement of faith. That's why it was convened. Okay. You yeah. words, before you go on. In other words, the heretics were already being challenged and condemned and refuted by the true believers long before Nicaea. But why then convene? Because Constantine wanted to put an end to the division. He wanted a unified empire because like Jesus said, if the kingdom is divided, can it stand? No. That's what his fear was. If I got my own subjects killing each other and fighting each other, then that's going to weaken my empire. I need them to come on board and be unified. But here's one more element before you ask your question. Are you aware that after Nicaea, the Arians had a resurgence and Constantine started backing up the Arians and then the Trinitarians got persecuted? I was not aware of that, no. See, that's something they don't tell you, do they? Absolutely. After Nicaea, the Arians still were stiff-necked and adamant in their opposition to the Trinity. And then Constantine ended up aiding them and enabling them with authority, meaning with the backing of soldiers, to oust Trinitarians, imprison Trinitarians, and have them killed. So much so that Athanasius, who was at the Council of Nicaea, was the bishop of Alexandria, Egypt. Five times he had to flee from his church because the Arians were, came with soldiers to arrest him and kill him. Five times. Wow. And this battle between Arians and Trinitarians finally came to an end. You know when? When was that? In the year 380, where you have Theodosius, the emperor, making Christianity the only religion of the state, and then restoring the Nicene Creed and imposing it. Okay. Everyone got that? You understand? Uh, I pray God gives me perfect recall of the facts. Now, you guys can fill in details in the comment section as well. So, Night Council Nicaea was simply trying to get the Christians to be united. So, Athanasius came and Arius was there. They were now debating each other which view is the actual teaching of scripture and the tradition passed on by the apostles, whether orally through their successors or in writing. Well, they debated that. They debated it. It was exiled five times. Athanasius saying, Jesus is not created. Arius says, no, he is created. And then finally, Athanasius and his camp won out. Why? Because the evidence of scripture and the tradition of the apostles won out. And they demonstrated from the evidence of Scripture, tradition of the apostles, that they did not teach Arians, Arius's view. Okay. So just to give you the correct history, but go ahead with your question. Oh, by the way, out of the 318 bishops, we have records showing 302 of them had physical injuries because these Christians were killing each other, beating each other, and maiming each other. They were not like the effeminate evangelic fishes, the effeminate queer baits of today. Oh, I don't see Jesus anymore. They would knock each other's teeth out, maim each other's eyes, cut off their limbs. People came there with one eye or limbs cut off, bruises, 
because they went to blow and attacked each other in the streets. Got it, got it. Uh, that was actually kind of my, my, my main question when you did answer it initially was the fact that if believing or if you deny the Trinity is so essential, but due to the fact that um, it was, I mean, they, they believe that it was mainly established in uh, the 30s. Before Nicaea, you know? let, let me answer your question. Before Nicaea, Justin Martyr is around, and you went to Justin Martyr in his church, and he said, Christ is a creature. He's not truly God. He's not the God of the Old Testament. He's going to say, oh, sure, come here. Welcome. Let's uh, sing Humbaya. What do you think you would have been done to you? I, I, well, that's a. Brother, I, I don't even think you're a Christian. If you, if, I don't think you're a Christian, brother. I think you're probably a Buddhist. Because if you don't know your history and you assume that because the Trinity was made quote unquote official in Nicaea, that somehow before that, because it wasn't if, official, then there was freedom to believe what you want. I don't think you're, what are you really? Are you a Buddhist? No, man. No, no. I mean, that wasn't my, 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 my main question. My main okay. question. But you were telling me, you said because you were thinking it wasn't made official until Nicaea, that therefore it, may, it must not be an essential doctrine to believe, right? No. So his, his main point was if it's so essential for your salvation oh. and with all... Oh, you're the, speaking uh, about him, not you. Okay, you got me confused. I think you're asking me. Oh, no, 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 my bad. I should, I should have made it more clear. No, I'm a believer in the Trinity God. Um, I see. Uh, You're saying, he's saying, if it was so essential, then why is it that it was only made official at Nicaea? The guys say, this is what happens when you kiss the black stone too much. Who told you that prior to Nicaea, the bishops appointed by the apostles and their successors did not hammer and teach that the Trinity is who God is and Christ is not created. In fact, if your friend was thinking a little more deeply, why the hell would they need to convene the Council of Nicaea if you didn't have Trinitarians already condemning those who didn't believe in the Trinity and throwing them out? Yeah. Do you understand my point? Yeah, I do understand your point. The, Nicaea was convened because the Trinitarian bishops we're ousting and throwing out Arius and his followers. Doesn't that tell you that it was an essential doctrine to the point that Arius's bishop, Alexander, condemned him and threw him out of the church? Yeah, clear as day. So where is this guy getting? Well, if it's essential, why wasn't it made official? Who told you that it wasn't understood that this is an essential core doctrine before Nicaea convened? Yeah, no, that, that's that's amazing context. Now I understood what you're saying. I thought you were saying, well, because I didn't know you're saying this is his argument. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I'm uh, sorry for the confusion. No, uh, okay, so you uh, got it now? Yeah. Do you understand how to respond to that nonsense? Because you explained yeah. to him, hold on. Alexander, the Bishop of Alexandria, who was the Bishop of Athanasius Arius, condemned Arius and ousted Arius because he denied the Trinity. Well, if the Trinity wasn't already an essential doctrine, why would he be condemned for not holding it? Just starting off for how essential the belief was in the Trinity. Thank you. But just because a council comes to try to bring unity and propose a creed that everyone had to sign on, doesn't mean that creed wasn't already believed on and fought for prior to 325. Got it. You know, you uh, perfect, perfectly uh, explained it's it. It's recorded, by the way. You can, come on, you can come on YouTube channel and rehear the answer because it's recorded. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. I'm going to take way better notes just so I can, uh, you know, study it just so it can be, uh, I can just, you know, reverse it. <clears throat> but, let uh, me encourage you to read one article, one of many, but you won't see the link here. It's on my blog. Just one example of what I mean that the Trinity was already known and firm prior to Nicaea by the successors of the apostles, the bishops they appointed, Ignatius of Antioch, Syria. Now, you can't see it because you're not on my live stream. I'm going to send it to Albi in private chat, and I don't know how he's going to get it to you, or you can come on YouTube and see it. Let me just bring it up. Yeah, on and he's on my Discord, so we can, uh, I'll, we'll post it on the Discord. 
Ignatius of Antioch was a disciple of the apostles, an eyewitness. He was taught by the apostles, such as Paul, Peter, John. He was the made the bishop of Antioch, Syria. That's when people were called Christians for the first time in Antioch, Syria. It's in Acts 11, 26. It says there in Antioch, they were called Christians for the first time. Okay, now watch. Ignatius wrote seven letters on his way to being fed to the beasts in the Colosseum. He was arrested and he was sent to Rome to be killed, to be martyred. And he went there gladly. And he wrote seven letters. Some of the letters he wrote to churches that Paul wrote to, like Romans and Ephesians. In this letter, Preserve 7, written by around 107 AD, 107 AD, 170 years after the birth of Christ, anywhere from 107 to 112, he shows you what the apostles had taught their bishops, the Christians at that time. Look what he says about Christ. I'm going to read some snippets, all right? You ready? Yeah. He's now writing to the Ephesians, same church that Paul wrote to. And all of his letters are translated English online, and I link to it. Ignatius, who is also called Theophorus, to the church which is at Ephesus in Asia, deservedly most happy, being blessed in the greatness and fullness of God the Father, and predestinated before the ages of time that it should be always for enduring and unchangeable glory, being united and elected, now watch, through the true passion by the will of the Father and Jesus Christ our God. Greek, to Theu Himon, the Father and Jesus Christ, the God of us. He affirms Jesus is not the Father. The Father is God, but Jesus is the God of us. Mm -hmm. okay? Now let me give you some more yeah. snippets. He talks about the blood of God. The blood of God. God has blood? Yeah, because God became man. Mm -hmm. Now watch here. You ready? Yeah. Chapter 7 of the letter. Look what he says about Jesus. There is one physician who is possessed both of flesh and spirit. So as man, he's flesh. As God, he's spirit. Both made and not made. Both born and unborn. You see what he's saying? Christ as God is unborn. Never made. But as man, he became man. Christ as God is spirit. But he became flesh. He became man. God existing in flesh, true life and death. He's God who's in flesh. He's God who is the source of life, who becomes man to experience human death, both of Mary and of God. First passable, meaning he died, and now impassable. Even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let me read a few more snippets. For our God, Jesus Christ, was... According to the appointment of God, conceived in the womb by Mary. Our God, Jesus, conceived in the womb by Mary of the seed of David by the Holy Ghost. So here's your trinity. He's the son of God. His physical body conceived from the womb of Mary by the Holy Ghost. And Jesus is our God. A few more. God himself manifested in human form for the renewal of eternal life. What's the noise in the background, dude? Who's hitting stuff? Kick, kick. Is that you, LB, you little loser? That's LB. <laughs> I think it's Mikey. <laughs> okay, now watch. Here's another. I'm going to read. Just don't go anywhere. This is the letter to the Magnesians. Look what he says about Christ. All right? And are entrusted with the ministry of Jesus Christ, who was with the Father before the beginning of time. So when there was no time, Jesus was already there with the Father. Mm -hmm. That means the Father and the Son are not the same person, destroying modalism, and the Father and Son are timeless. Who is this? Ignatius, writing 107, and 12 AD. The bishop of the church in Antioch, Syria, who died as a martyr, gladly, dying gladly for Christ, to show his love for Christ, a disciple of the apostles who was trained by them. Where do you think he learned this from? What do you think you learned all this? I can't hear you, man. Are you what? No, like the question that you asked me. Yeah, what? where do you think you learned this from? He learned it, wouldn't it be from the, from the, I mean, the Bible? Brother, do you drink alcohol? 
<laughs> no, I don't. Do you do you get high? No. By the time Ignatius wrote, they didn't have the full canon of scripture in their possession. <clears throat> Did you hear who I said Ignatius was? Ignatius. Read what I said, because I'm going to send you to the block blockosphere. Who is Ignatius? He's a theologian, no? Get get this guy the hell out of here, dude, and block him from your Discord. Get this guy out of here, Sharafi. No, he's a good brother, but uh, Mikey, God bless you. We'll, what God we'll... bless you? Block <laughs> him from Discord. All right, let's bring the next person up. I'm gonna have to block you, dude. The guy's a world class loser. I spent 20 minutes. Andy, I bet you're blonde, little loser. He's a theologian. No, no, your mother's a Shia. Go ahead, yalla. All right, Elaine Harb. You there? This guy's on your Discord, seriously? Yeah, he's a he's a he's a young man coming. I gotta block you from my channel, dude. If you have these kind of people, oh, yeah. I just spent 20 minutes and the guy didn't understand a thing. Yeah, I think he's nervous. Why? Looking at your ugly face, banging, ding ding dong. <laughs> I just wasted 20 minutes of my life, dude. I'm not getting younger. I can't redeem this time. So it was passed on through oral tradition. Buddy, who do you think taught Ignatius all this? Let's see if you got it before I ban you from my channel. Yeah, the disciple. Thank you. If I just told you he's a disciple of the apostles, who do you think taught him? Oh, my grandmother. Oh, maybe it was Plato. Perhaps Socrates? Why do you attract losers like you, brother? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, Al Elaine Harv. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, how are you? How are you doing? Uh, Albi, how are you, Sam? Good, man. What nationality are you, brother? Uh, I'm Lebanese. We've already talked. Once. I don't remember. You know how many people talk with accent? But go ahead, brother. What's going on? Yeah, uh, it's the second time I talk with you. I talked once with you. I had my little kid, Sherbet. Oh, yeah, Sherbel, that's right. God bless you. are named after Mar Sherbel. God bless you and your family, brother. Yes. What's up? Talk to me. Yeah, you were touching in one of your streams on uh, YouTube about the passage in Kings when God, uh, uh, when David took a census of the Israelites. Second Samuel 24, First Chronicles 21, yeah. Yeah, and uh, God punished uh, 70,000. Israelites for the census that uh, David took. Uh, you were about to touch on this uh, issue, but uh, I say, remind me because I didn't think. Yeah, remind me where I stopped because I think I didn't finish that point, but I don't remember. Yeah, you didn't. You didn't uh, got the time to to elaborate on it because there was a girl that uh, distracted you. And Why? He moved to another subject. But you were you were uh, about to to touch on it and to elaborate. So yeah, but you you remember better than me because I didn't watch the session. So what happened? What was I talking about? Give me some details because you watched it. I don't watch my old sessions. Yeah, actually, uh, it was like uh, a week ago, and uh, you were uh, discussing uh, the issues with uh, with Greg and uh, their theology right. and uh, Jehovah Witness. Oh and yeah. Pass through this passage. Yeah, why did I go there for Greg? Why, yeah, why did I go there for Greg though? What was the reason? Why did I mention it with Greg? I remember, it was like uh, uh, it wasn't uh, directly uh, focusing on the subject of the Jehovah Witness, but th there was this passage, and uh, you were about to say something about the fact that uh, they used to be in the uh, in the Old Testament uh, two ways by which God judges. Uh, the inequities of the fathers through the sons, but you didn't continue it. Fathers and the sons. Uh, yes. I, I don't remember what I said, but I don't, I'm trying to figure out what the gist is so I can explain to you uh, what it is because you're saying two ways, I said, fathers through the sons. Got to make it more clear, brother, because I don't watch my older sessions. What did I say, two ways, punish? What do you mean? Let's say, uh, let's keep it focused on this passage alone. That uh, God, uh, and, uh, he punished 70,000 Israelites for the census that David took. Yes. Uh, so what do you want to know about it? Let me be specific so I can know. 
Yeah, how are you to understand this? It's, it's uh, as if it's showing that uh, God uh, is uh, taking uh, the sins of David and uh, punishing. I'm waiting for you to tell me, man. Get to the point before the rapture, brother. Before uh, uh, Christmas. What's the, ask me the question? What do you want me to explain? Because you're getting to it. What's the question you want me to answer? Stuck for Allah, ya brother. Muhammad So what's the question? <coughs> why, why did the seventy got punished for the sense? That's oh, see, sweet and to point. I want to kiss your bald head. Instead of telling me you did, just say, brother, why did seventy thousand get killed? Stuck for Allah, Yeah. Okay, so we got it now. <laughs> you see how easy it was just to ask me? I can't hear it. What happened? We lost them. Sure. You saw how easy it was just to ask me the question. Hey, uh, brother, can you tell me why seventy thousand died when it's David sinned? Yeah, that's the question. See, that would have been easy if you just asked me that instead of trying to help me remember what I said. A week ago don't you think you're correct sir thank you sir all right now we can answer so hey sam do you remember what well, i don't remember what i had for breakfast yesterday <coughs> i don't even remember the last time yeah, i washed my underwear i don't remember you know why i don't remember <laughs> no you know why honestly i don't because I only wear shorts, no underwear. <laughs> Too much information. We got to now delete that. Okay, let's come back. You ready? Okay, are you ready now for the answer? Okay, he's asking the question. David sinned. He took a census. First Chronicles 21, 2 Samuel 24. He took a census upsetting God because David was getting too arrogant, too big for his britches. He was now trusting in his wealth, his numbers, the size of Israel, the size of his kingdom and the size of his military. And God got angry. Instead of trusting in God, he was looking to his mm, army. He was looking to the number of Israelites. He was looking to the possessions as his strength. And so now God punished David. How does he punish David? He brings a plague and it kills down the Israelites. And David himself is saying, these are innocent sheep. Punish my, me and my household. We're guilty. So why were they punished? This is what he's asking. Okay, are you ready now for the answer? I'm ready. Okay, now guys, we need you to listen. All right, now I like this guy. He's, he's a man after my heart, Enki Assyrian. The Bible teaches something that we call, this is a term we, we use, corporate solidarity. I'm going to explain these terms. Corporate solidarity federal headship because the bible is teaching us a valuable lesson if we believe the bible story we have one human head adam we're all descendants of adam so we're all part of the same family so whether we like it or not we're all related everyone comes from adam and eve so at the end of the day we're all related we're all one family so what god is teaching us through this is because we're one family we're all related we must live in a way that will be responsible and not irresponsible because whether you like it or not, your actions will affect others who are members of your family. Imagine a body because the Bible calls the church the body of Christ. And it even uses this illustration in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27. And I'll show it to you in a minute. If one part of the body hurts, the whole body is out of whack. If you have a toothache, even though it's only your tooth, you can't function, right? Even though your hand is not hurting, your feet is not hurting, your chest is not hurting, that toothache knocks you out and leaves you pretty much useless, right? Or an earache, right? Even an earache. Have you had earaches? Okay. It's just your ear, but it knocks you out. It throws off your equilibrium. Okay, what's the point? We're all part of the same body. We're members of the same body. So whatever I do, whether I like it or not, it's going to affect the other members. And I'm going to now give you examples, and I'm going to show you from Scripture. So I'm going to give you examples because our everyday experience, 
the life we live proves the Bible is 100% accurate. All the things we do show that the Bible is right on the money when it talks about human condition, human experience. Because the God who created humanity is a God who inspired the Bible. So he knows humanity better than they do. So the Bible accurately describes the human experience. Okay. You are the head of your household. You are the head of your household. Let's see you do. You get drunk. You get drunk. You drive in a car. You're driving 120 miles an hour. You smash into an incoming car. You kill the entire family dead. Father, mother, several children. Because of your wicked sin, your responsibility, you now killed an entire family. But now, because of that, you'll be thrown in jail for the rest of your life. Now your wife and children suffer because now she doesn't have a husband and they don't have a father to provide and care. See what you just did? How many lives you screwed up? Yeah, that's yeah, it's a very good explanation. But I'm going to give you more. You see what happened here. Okay. But why is your wife and children suffering? And why did that family suffer when you're the idiot, and I'm saying this generally, I'm not saying, who got drunk and was irresponsible and drove irresponsibly? Because this is God's way of showing whether you like it or not, you're not alone. You're not isolated. You're not an island to yourself. You're connected with others. And what you do will affect others, and what they do will affect you, good or bad. So if you know this, you're going to live responsibly. Okay, let's take another example. You are unfaithful to your wife. You're unfaithful to your wife. God forbid. You go around, sleep around. You now sleep with the wrong person and you contract AIDS. Your innocent wife, who's been faithful to you, doesn't know. You now come sleep with her and you give her AIDS. She's now pregnant and she gives birth to a child and that child has AIDS. You see how many lives you screwed up? Yeah, exactly. That's so what, what God is showing David. You're the king of the people. You're their head. What you do will affect them. So when you make a mistake, that mistake will not only affect you, it's going to affect all those who are underneath you because you're their head and your actions will affect them good or bad. It'll either bring a curse or a blessing. You don't even use, you need to use David. Let's look at the situation between Palestine and Israel. Palestine and Israel. Do you see what's happening? In Palestine right now. Now I'm going to get a lot of people upset. And let me be clear. I'm not pro-Israel. I'm not pro-Palestine. I could give a damn for any government agency. My allegiance is to Jesus and his kingdom. When a nation is wrong, it's wrong. If it's America or Israel. What Hamas did was evil. But you see what Hamas did? You see because of what they did? Now they gave Netanyahu a pretext to now go bomb indiscriminately, bombing and killing over 30,000 people, many who are elderly and innocent children and babies. Gave them now the excuse to do that. Now, I'm not saying that's right. Netanyahu, guys, I'm going to upset you, Zionist. He's a monster because to go and bomb indiscriminately, Palestinians, and by the way, you evangelicals, many of those Palestinians are Christians. But you wouldn't care less because they're Palestinian. Babies being blown to smithereen. Elderly being blown to smithereen. Even when a food truck came, you had, what was it, seven workers who came in to bring food supplies. Gunned down by the IDF. There's no excuse for the atrocity. But what's my point? You even see that the choices of leaders bring about disastrous consequences amen right that's yes, right exactly especially in this context uh, david is king over the nation so he's head of the nation that's the point okay. so you, see, you see what god is showing you right you see what god is showing you right he's yeah. showing you you better be careful what you do because others are going to be affected now let's use the example of a corporation a building a company little more neutral so I don't get the Christian Zionists to condemn me as an anti-Semitic because that's how they are. You're like, no, no, I am pro-Jesus. I'm pro-Bible. I'm pro-Christ rule. I don't give a damn about any 
earthly government, be it Israel, Palestine, or America, because I'm not a citizen of the world. It says, I'm a stranger and my citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3, 20, 21. And I'm waiting Jesus to come from heaven to establish God's kingdom on earth in all its fullness. Amen. But now coming to you, imagine you have a company and you have 10,000 employees. However, because of the heavy taxation of the American government, and how much you have to pay your employees. You decided it's going to be more cost effective and I'll make more money if I shut down the company here and I go and open one in Mexico. Because in Mexico, I don't have these regulations, these taxes, and I can hire 10,000 people at a tenth of what I'm paying American employees. Can I watch that decision? You shut down your company in America, 10,000 people are now jobless. How many people were affected by your decision? Yeah, that's correct. 10,000. But not only 10,000. What about their families that depended on them and their paycheck? Yeah. Right. But now that was a curse on them. But now watch the reverse. You now build that company in Mexico. 10,000 people now work. And now 10,000 people are earning a paycheck to now pay bills and feed their families. You see, that act was a blessing to them in Mexico. But your act in America was a curse upon your employees. You see how it works? Yep. You see the wisdom, what God is showing you? Live responsibly. Your actions are going to affect others, whether you like it or not, because you're all part of one body. Whether you like it or not, you're going to affect the other members of your body. You with me there? Yeah, that's good. Yep. Let me show you that in the Bible. He's going to read for you 1 Corinthians 12. He's going to read for you 12 to 27. All right. <clears throat> now look at this dumb bastard, son of a satanic whore. Prove <laughs> it, you bastard. Prove it, giving us your Zionist propaganda, you son of the devil. Give us the footage proving what you said, you satanic bastard, son of Satan. Pit on you and your Zionism, you filthy, lying murderer but anyway okay first corinthians 12 12 to 27 12 to 27 see what the bastard did to justify the killing of over ten thousand children no the donation is going to build tunnels putting missiles there show us the footage you son of the devil instead of giving us idf propaganda but go ahead for as the body is one and has many members but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? You understand his point, brother? You know what he's saying? Every member of the body depends on the other members of the body. And no member can exist in isolation apart from the rest of the body. If I cut off my hand and I throw it, it's useless. It dies and withers, right? Correct. My hand only functions when it's attached to my body. If I pluck out my eye, it's useless, right? If right. my eye gets plucked out and you throw it, can it see? No. It only sees when it's attached to my body. This is what he's saying. You're only functional when you're connected to the body. But if you're severed from the body... You become dysfunctional, and then the rest of the body is affected. Because if my eye is plucked out, now I don't have as clear as vision. If one of my hands is cut off, I'm not as effective. You see what Paul is saying about we being the body? It's not about members of the church. Keep going. <clears throat> but now God has set the members, each one of them, into the body just as he is pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. 
And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Let me explain what he means. The janitor who cleans your church and washes your toilets is just as much important as your pastor. Do not look down upon him. You understand what he's saying? That janitor in your church that's taking out the garbage, cleaning the church, the toilets, to keep the church spotless and clean so people can come to a church that's not full of germs, bacteria, or decrepit and disgusting, he's just as important because he's making the church <clears throat> in such a way where the pastor can come or the priest can come and serve and not have to deal with, let's say, asbestos or let's say with, you get the point of Paul. But instead, we look at the janitor and we ignore him because he's insignificant and we give all the focus to the pastor and we want his attention. But that poor janitor who gets noticed by no one, he's getting noticed by Jesus. Amen. Because would you go and clean the toilets of the church? Would you go and mop the, the, the toilets of the church? Would you go and clean the kitchen or the floors or clean down the pews and the, to make sure it's spotless, make sure it's shining and it's not decrepit or you don't have cobwebs or you, you get the point, right? Yeah, and the passage is uh, right on point. This is what he's saying. But our tendency, tendency is, we look to the apologists like me. We look to the bishops. We look to the pastors. We look to the debaters and we give them more honor. We give them more attention and we want their attention more than the janitor or the secretary. This is what Paul is saying is wrong. Everyone. Paul is saying this is wrong. You understand his point? And it's true, isn't it? Human tendency. Uh, human tendency. Everyone wants my attention. Everyone and their mother. Oh, Sam Shimon. Sam Shimon. I'm not lying. They want my attention as if I'm Paul. Or if they get to touch me, they're going to have a high rank in heaven. I'm being honest. I'm not trying to not humble. because I'm being honest. People, and it doesn't help that TikTok made me go viral. Today, I went to, again, I'm not trying to boast. I went to the Catholic Church to take Eucharist. I go outside. There's an Indian guy. You're Sam Shimon, aren't you? I go, you recognize me? Yeah. I was in another place. Sam Shimon. Okay. This is what Paul is warning against. Stop looking at these people who are in the forefront. Not saying they're not important. Obviously, they are. But don't make them more than they are and elevate them and idolize them. Because they're still human who can fail and disappoint the Lord and break your heart. You remember Ravi Zacharias and the scandal and how many hearts he broke? I do. Yeah. That was bad. And stop ignoring those people who are not in the forefront in the limelight and think they're insignificant. In fact, point of fact, let me tell you, a lot of people could not be doing what they're doing without the people behind the scenes praying for them and supporting them. Here, I'll give you an example. Had it not been for those brothers and sisters whom God knows, he knows them by name, contributing PayPal and Patreon, making sure I have enough to pay my bills, I couldn't be doing this. You know how great their blessing is? And yet nobody knows them. Only the Lord knows them. You understand how great the blessing is of that one person who gives $2 or that person who gives $5? Or even people give 50 cents or $10 or 100 No one knows who they are. The Lord knows who they are because it's their support that enables me to now bless multitudes with in-depth exegesis of Scripture. And yet, no one knows who they are. They can walk by you and you won't know, hey, that's the guy who gives Sam Shimon $100 a month. And it had not been for him and the others, Sam Shimon could not be blessing me with the teaching. This is what Paul is talking about. That's good. 
No, this is what Paul is talking about. It's not me. This is what Paul is talking about. It's not I'm good. It's the Holy Spirit who is infinitely good moving Paul to write this. Keep reading. <clears throat> and those members of the body which we Hold think... On, I want to bless this, brother. Michael, I love you too. And you're a bastard. And you're a spiritual dog. And you're garbage. I hope now you receive my blessing. I'd spit on you, but my spit is better than you. Go ahead, brother. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable... On these we bestow greater honor, and our. Somebody said, "Those we consider less honorable, we should show them greater honor." Do you hear what he said? Yeah. The ones you think are insignificant, give them all the more honor because they're not getting the attention that the pastor is getting, and they're human too, and they need to be loved and be affirmed. Everyone wants to take the pastor out to lunch. But how many people say to the janitor, hey, man, let me take you out to lunch? Do you understand his point? Yeah, exactly. How beautiful your Bible is, how supernatural and how deep the Bible is, and see our to God. How many people run up to take the pastor out to lunch, the bishop out to lunch? But how many people say to that janitor, hey, brother, you know what? I want to take you out to lunch. Or you know what? Thanksgiving dinner? I want you to come to my house because a lot of people who don't have families to do life with. Do you see the point? Hey, uh, Sam, this is also another image. We can take it as another image of uh, the meaning of intercession. It also yep. shows that we are all responsible for the salvation of one another. Exactly. I kiss your head. You got it. We're all involved in blessing and saving others we're all part of it we're part of the program i'm going to show you another beautiful passage of our lord the lord says let me tell you sorry sometimes when i think about the goodness of the lord he moves me in my spirit i'm going to show you some right after this the lord tells you who'd invite for thanksgiving who'd invite for christmas who'd invite for dinner I'm going to show it to you how beautiful the heart of Jesus is. But finish it because I want to finish it. I'm going to show you. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. You know what I mean? There are certain parts you don't just show in the public, right? Your mm -hmm. body parts. He's saying those are things you can't show. But what he's saying it. He's not saying it that there are parts of the body of Christ that are undesirable that you don't show. What he's saying is there are people in our church that we consider undesirable and we're ashamed of because they're not rich enough. They don't have the finest clothes. They don't look the best. They're not as good looking. They're not as eloquent. And we're embarrassed by them. And we want to now cover them as if we're covering a body part that cannot be exposed. Do you see his, his words, how brilliant this man was? May the spirit fill us like he filled Paul. Mm. He's saying there are people in the church we treat as a body part that we would never show because it'd be shameful to show we covered it. Like the male genitals, right? You don't go around flashing it unless you're sick, right? So what he's saying is you treat some people as if it's a male organ to embarrassing to show so you just cover him up or ignore him there is no such thing in the body of christ as a body part that is shameful to show so why do you then treat that member of the body of christ as if it's a body part that needs to be covered not exposed publicly who do you think you are you understand what he's saying here why are you embarrassed to be seen by that guy whose clothes are not the finest, who's wearing raggedy clothes, who doesn't look as good, he's not as handsome, or maybe he is obese and you're ashamed of his weight, or maybe why do you treat him as a body part that's disgraceful to uncover? Who do you think you are? You understand the message? Yes, sir. This is the message. Who are you to look down on that man who doesn't have a car but has to take a bus and you're driving 
Alexis, who the hell you think you are to look down upon that man that can't afford nice clothes? He comes in raggedy, but you're wearing a thousand dollar suit. Who the hell do you think you are that you look down on that man? This is Paul's point. We're finishing. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. You see, that was the key of David. If one member suffers, it's going to affect the whole body, whether you like it or not. Keep reading. All right. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you now, are before the... you move on, isn't that true? If a member of church does something outstanding and it gets the attention of the world, doesn't that also bring attention to his church? If he's a member of the church and he's acting on behalf of the church and he does something amazing, doesn't that credit go to the whole church that he belongs to? You get it, brother? Because I can't hear. Is he there? One of the examples is uh, the last incident with Marmari and the forgiveness that he showed to, to his uh, yeah. attacker. Yep. And then it brought all attention to that little church, right? Exactly. That's the whole point. But then finish it to 27 because I want to show you we're talking about who to invite. Everyone wants to invite Sam Shimon. Everyone wants to call David Wood. Everyone wants to hang out with Jay Smith. But how many people want to hang out with that, the janitor? That's his point. And it's true. Everyone wants the attention of those who are in the forefront. Everyone wants Christian Prince to notice them. Why? Are we Paul? Are we John? Are we Peter? let alone Jesus? Who the hell cares if you, you get my attention or not? And I'll be the first one to turn you off so you never think about trying to get my attention. You don't believe me? Ask Alby. Alby, am I lying? No, absolutely. That's why I blocked him several times, and I'm planning to block him again in the near future. But go ahead. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. 27. So you read it, right? We're all members. We're all parts of the same body. One hurts, we all hurt. One is honored, we're all honored. And here, just like this guy said it, how many times you have people attack Catholic Church saying, hey, pedophiles, because of the filthy wolves that prey on children. And then they condemn the entire church, think all of them are perverts. Right? Exactly. So I hope that answered your question, but I want to give you something to remind everyone. May we practice what we preach. Jesus tells you who to invite. That's why when I read this, I start bawling. That's why I was crying earlier. Luke 14, 12 to 14. Guys, pay attention. Jesus tells you who to invite for Thanksgiving, who to invite for a party, who to invite for Christmas. Yet sadly, I don't know of many people who do this. I don't. In my circle, Christians, I don't see this. They'll invite them to the church. But Jesus didn't say invite them to the church. Invite them to your home, your house. Look what he says, Luke 14, 12 to 14. Then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the, oh. lame, the poor, the maimed, the so lame. Invite mm -hmm. the physically handicapped. Invite the people in wheelchairs. Invite the homeless. Keep reading. <clears throat> but when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. You see the, the heart of Jesus? Amazing. Why are you inviting your friends or your cousins? How come you don't invite that blind person mm -hmm. or that physically handicapped person or that homeless person? Why not invite them to your house? Give them a cooked meal. Show them the love of Christ. He didn't say church. He goes, 
home. Invite him to your home. Will you do that? I mean, see again. No, we want Sam Shimun to come over. Why? Oh, bring on David Wood. Why? Because you want my attention? How the hell am I going to make it better for you in heaven? And then verse 15, look what the man says here. There was one listening. Look what he said. But no. when one of those who were reclined at table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who eat bread in the kingdom of God. This is the heart of Jesus. But my question is, how many actually do this? How many actually invite the poor? Invite the less privileged? Invite the sick, the physically challenged? I haven't seen it. I'll be honest. I'm not saying they're not there. I haven't seen it. Thanksgiving, everyone's inviting their family. Christmas, everyone's inviting their family. But Jesus says, that's not who you invite. You invite those who have no family to invite them. And those who can't afford a Thanksgiving meal, can't afford turkey, can't afford a Christmas meal, invite them. And if you don't have, let's say, an apartment where you can cook, take them out. Hey, friend, let's go out and have Christmas dinner. Let's go out. Let's go celebrate Thanksgiving together. This is the heart of Jesus. This is the heart of my master. Beautiful. Oh, he is beautiful. He makes grown men cry. Hey. This is his heart. Sorry. When I read it, it makes me cry like a baby. Sorry. I'm going to read it one more time, brother. I just want to read it. <clears throat> and he also went on to say, to the one who invited him. See, now, the context is the man invited Jesus because of Jesus' status and reputation. He heard Jesus as a prophet, maybe the Messiah. And Jesus is telling him, thanks for the invite, but let me tell you, it wasn't me whom you should have invited. Not meaning he's ungrateful, just saying, here's the heart of God. Here's my heart. When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return. That, that will be your repayment. Here's the heart of Jesus. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Why? I will repay you. I will pay you for what you did for them. I'm sorry. This is what moves me. He's saying, don't you know? He's saying, don't you know I have them in my heart and I will pay you for your kindness to them? I will pay you? So he's saying, I'm taking up the responsibility. You love them for my sake. You're kind for my sake. I will bless you. The poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. That shows you his heart. And you will be blessed. Since they don't have the means to repay you. For it will be repaid to you at the resurrection of the righteous. I will repay. I say, son, here's your payment for feeding the blind. Feeding the poor, the crippled, the lame. You did it for me. You love them for me. I'm now going to repay you. Now enter into my banquet. Enter into my feast. And feast with me forever and ever. That's the art of Jesus. Now I hope that answered your question, brother. I know it took a long time, but this was an important question. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you for the elaboration. Scripture, brother. Scripture is brilliant. Any other question or you're done? Thank you, sir. Thank you for your humbleness, Sam, and uh, God preserve you. And I pray he preserves us all. Uh, young man, God strengthen you. Amen, Amen brother. Lord Amen. preserve you in your household. Amen. God bless you. Yes, yeah, sorry. This was something that Spirit moved me to talk about because it's very important. And then it ties back to the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus. How can you 
leave Jesus once you see how good he is, how beautiful he is, and you've tasted him. It's impossible. You cannot live without him. You cannot, once you get to know Jesus truly and not lip service, impossible to live without him. Impossible. You can't. Amen. And Any other questions? Go ahead. Let me know. You got it, brother. I hope you Christians are falling in love with Jesus more because that's that's the goal of a teacher. Let me tell you what a teacher should strive for if he's a teacher of the Spirit, and I pray I am. The teacher should never bring attention to himself, should never make you think more highly of him, and that he makes himself the standard for you to live up to. A teacher of the Spirit has to always make you fall more in love with Jesus. Always reveals how beautiful Jesus is, how glorious Jesus is, because you cannot do him justice. You can't love him enough. You can't take him off. You cannot do him justice. No matter how much you try to show how glorious he is, you'll always fall short. The teacher points to Jesus, never to himself. And if my testimony is, if the Lord tarries and I die, that Sam Shimon pointed me to Jesus, not to himself, I will die happy. Definitely pointed me to Jesus. I'll die happy. That if people say, Sam showed me how beautiful Jesus is, and he made Jesus more beautiful to me, then I can stand before my Lord. I don't know I'm getting emotional, but go ahead. I don't know I'm getting emotional. Yeah. Sam, Sam, let me read a comment real quick. <clears throat> I've been struggling to Bible read spontaneously. Now I'm going to always read in my free time. Thank you, God, for using Sam. Amen. That's the goal. I don't know, guys. If you ask me I'm getting emotional, I don't know. I'm just today something, just hearing the words of Jesus. Ooh. <clears throat> I, I love my Lord. He knows my heart better than me. <clears throat> I love my Lord. But go ahead. Go ahead ask, what's the next question? Okay. A AI or Al, you there? Yeah, hello. Hello. Yeah, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I would like to say thank you to Brother Sam and Brother Abby. Uh, we are really grateful for the work you do for God. It is amazing God, the teachings and the things you have put out there for people to understand, especially coming from a Muslim background. My name is uh, Summer. I am an ex-Muslim. Lord God. God. I'm not, I am not, um, uh, I was raised in Saudi Arabia and have, oh, wow. Wow. Known um, Islam from day one, basically. Um, the only struggle uh, I had in the beginning of my um, conversion was um, it, it was so difficult to understand how to become a Christian because my brain and my mind was wired to um, do to do good deeds and how to get to heaven. Um, so for I struggled for a very long time to have a relationship with God. And it I'm still, I find myself still learning a lot. And I really enjoy your teachings, Brother Sam and Brother Abby. It means a lot. I just want to appreciate you today that you put all this effort to people like us who are struggling to understand few things and to just come to the place where to feel the love of God is as <laughs> it's amazing to kind of like have that relationship with God, to see it in a different perspective than what we were told. Um, I know there are a lot of Muslims out there who sees Islam differently, but in the perspective of where I come from, it is very, it was very kind of radical in that way. Um, 
I just have few questions regarding. You're free to ask. Now let me ask you something. You can't go back to Saudi Arabia, can you? No, 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 not at all. You understand? You came from Saudi Arabia. You left Saudi Arabia, and if they find out and they catch you, they're going to kill you, right? Oh yeah, definitely. We all you know. Are hearing this in the West? I want because I want the West to hear. West, do you hear it? She came from a radical Islamic background, Saudi Arabia. She left. She's trying to understand the Christian faith and grow. If she makes the mistake of going to Saudi Arabia and they catch her, she's going to be seeing Jesus. They're going to send her to Jesus. So go ahead, sister. Um, I have, I have, I have, I have. So, um, so I do not live in Saudi Arabia, but in the environment of where I am right now, it's a free um, speech and free whatever you want to say, but. And I struggle a lot actually to read the 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 the, the Bible because it, it is nothing like the Quran as I grew up learning as a compulsory and as a, a subject that must be in school. But um, the thing is that I I wanna I wanna um, I I would really love to know if there is a place in in your page or whatever, because honestly, I haven't really checked yet, but I was so honored today when I saw the chat. Two days ago, I wanted to catch up, but today I just wanted, okay, let me try my luck and see how it goes. But I really would like to know more deeper teachings about Islam that to to to, to show more of, you know, um, greater points of why Islam is not as... Um, well, there's a lot of lot of as, sessions and articles. As, as, exactly. I have gone few of them, but I would really like to have, like, if there is um, a place where there are points or, like, you know, um, scriptures are being, like, or surahs that has been, you know, been put out. I have read few of them as well. I have there's seen... Too many on our websites. Uh, we have whole sections on the websites. This whole... Right. Articles on Islam, its problems, contradictions, corruption, immorality. We have all, tons of it. So if you're looking for... What is the website? If I may... This is why over there. You can't give her any links, huh? Over there? Yeah, we can. Can I, I have I, it on the chat, please? Yeah, so we have a moderator here. I think they figured out how to do it where okay. they can post well, it. Well, you're going to send her answeringislam.info. Hmm. Okay. Answering Islam.info. She's got to get that link. But now you can see if it works because in some countries they have blocked the website. Answering Islam.info. Answering Islam.info. Okay. Yeah, if you're on the computer, see if you can access it. Um, um, are you asking me if I'm on a computer? Or? Yeah, if you're on a computer, see if you're where you're I'm at. I'm in my car right now. No, I'm just what? on my phone. Okay, well, you're gonna because I don't know if you in certain countries they've banned this, but that one you have it's mm -hmm. a comprehensive website. You'll see it has sections Quran, Bible, God, Jesus, Muhammad, and then each section will have Quran, corruption, Quran, variant readings, Quran, contradiction, so on and so forth. It's in the chat right now, sister. You see it. Yeah, but she can't. I, she's on the phone. I don't think she can click on it. She can, I'm just going to take a screenshot of it. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate it. Start um, with that. I think. Start sorry. with that. Start with that. But also, you have, for example, if you're looking for destruction of Islam, you have good YouTube channels like Apostate Prophet and David Wood. I forgot it, David Wood's uh, channel. The name is it Apologetics Roadshow. He, he yeah. does a lot with the Apostate Prophet on destroying Islam, showing why Islam is false. Apostate Prophet, interesting, was a Muslim. He became atheist. He's agnostic. He's on his way of becoming a Christian. His atheist wife is now becoming an Orthodox. So she became Christian. She's going into the Orthodox Church. So they do a lot on destroy, uh, destroying Islam, showing you the problems with the Quran, the Hadith, and Muhammad's life. That's another good one. They're good. Yeah. Also, so Apologetics Roadshow, that's what it's called. So another good one. Now, how are you going to find him? This one's going to be hard. 
All right. I got to find the name. Usama Doc Doc. Usama Doc Doc has another good one. Let me get you. I'm going to send it to him in private so he can know the name. Let me get there on YouTube. Usama Doc Doc channel. It's I called. I think it's called the Straight Gate. Straight, straight Way. Let me find it. Yep, here it is. The Straight Way of Grace Ministry. I want to now share it. Straight Way of Grace Ministry. It's a YouTube channel. He also has superb material videos destroying Islam, showing Islam. It's a morality. It's contradictions. It's corruption. Sira International. I want to make another one. C I R A. I have been watching as well, Sira International. Oh, yeah. Yes. These I are all. Well. What? But the other one, would you send it privately? The 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 Osama. You yes, said... I just sent it in private. Do you see it in private chat on my stream yard, brother? Yeah, I just can't. Um... It's uh, oh, it's. I I got it. Let me put it in right the there. chat. The straight way of grace ministry, Mister. That's right oh. there on on the screen, but that's a, cha mm -hmm. a channel. I just sent the URL. The straight way yeah. of grace ministry. So phenomenal. They're blocking because they're aware of the websites and they don't want Muslims to read. <clears throat> they don't want Muslims to read. But sister, any other questions? Um, not really. But I, I had, um, I, I when I joined the chat or the uh, the live, it was around the time where you were speaking uh, regarding confession, uh, confessions, in yes. the. Uh, in general, uh, if I, 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 I wasn't sure what was the question in general yeah, well, in the beginning, but I. Right now, sister. Sorry? You're a babe of the faith, right? How long have you been a Christian? I have been a Christian since 2005. And have I, you studied the core doctrines of the Christian faith? I'm just curious because you've been in the faith 2005, but. No. So that is the unfortunate thing. I have struggled in a, it, for quite a, a years that um, I would go to church, I would be in the church, but it wasn't it wasn't given. Like it, I would just because um, I was struggling to kind of adapt. If if you understand my point, and that's what I was trying to say earlier, is that my way of seeing christianity today it's not the same seeing it back then and i think that is a lot of things that we need to teach people who are coming from such a background from an islamic background because all i have done was like just do the rituals or try to do the right things it wasn't like i had a relationship or in that way so my search was always very vague in a way that i i, I was just like you know, hitting walls a few times and things like that. And so that is why I am now picking up the pieces and trying to go, you know, after having to understand what it is all about. I don't know if that makes sense. So how long have you been trying to study the faith and understand it? So um, it's been actually since mostly from last year i had more um that's what i wanted to know that's what i want to figure out so it's been only about a year so this is why i'm saying what you need to focus on is the nature of god who god is what he's like right Jesus is. that means the most important aspect of your relationship is god because mm -hmm. that's the one you love that's one you serve that's one who loves you so you got to know who he is <clears throat> what he's like so i don't worry about confession and whether going to a pastor to convert, that's right now, you need to get to know the nature and character of God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What is the Trinity? Is it true? How can it be true? Is Jesus God in the flesh? Learn who God is. Learn why you believe this from Scripture. Because the God you worship will impact the kind of person you'll be. Amen. So Amen. you need to know who this God is. And once you get to know his character you're going to see the difference is going to make in your life focus on that god how do i have a relationship with this god what does it mean to have a relationship with this god 
These are the most important. Obviously, you got to be in a church. You got to be in a solid church. That is a given. Now, I'm assuming you got baptized. Oh, yeah, I I did. That's what it is. That's what I was trying to say. As soon as I became a Christian, not up to a year later, I gave my life to Christ because the way I even became a Christian, it was not because I understood what Christianity was. It was literally I was a Muslim and I was very radical about my ways and how I hated Christians and Jews. And to be honest and put it out there, I was told how to rather bring their life down so I can make it to heaven. That was all my goal. I didn't really care about knowing God in that way. So I just you just wanted to make it to heaven. You don't want to go to hell. Yeah, exactly. You would say that. But when Jesus appeared to me in my dream. Oh, so that part you didn't tell us. So right? we had a dream of Jesus. Wow. <laughs> I have seen Jesus and I even have more to it. But, but that was... Um, and I gave my life in a way like I gave my life to Jesus. What happened in the dream, though? Realizing I did that. What because happened in the I dream? I tried to commit suicides a few times. After the dream or before the dream? Before the dream. Um, <clears throat> you mean the, the, the suicide? Sister, sister, the sister, sister, you're going to get me banned. Yes. You, got, you can't use certain words on these lives. Okay. Just okay. But we understand the sentiment. Yeah, okay, so after or before yeah. you wanted to leave the world? Was it uh, after or before the dream? It was before meeting him, definitely. Okay, so when you saw him in the dream, what happened? What did he say to you? So uh, basically, I, <laughs> yeah, I had, so I had tried to, before meeting Jesus, I had a few um times try to convert people or Christians or Jews into 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 Islam. I was very radical about it. Um, and then one day I had um, a boyfriend who was a Christian and I wanted to convert him to Islam. And so, for Allah, you had a Christian boyfriend? Sorry? You had a Christian boyfriend stuck for Allah? <laughs> Were you wearing hijab? You, you're too far away from the phone. I can hear. Did you wear hijab? So I wore hijab only when I was doing Ramadan and fasting. Okay, I did well, the hijab at uh, home when I was living in Saudi Arabia, but not 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 when I moved out. Um, so this was out this was out of Saudi Arabia after having left at the Middle East. That's when I met this guy and i was uh, very interested in being together with him but my values at that time was to get married and he must convert to islam oh, billah, oh, billah. Process, exactly so during the process i tried to play smart by saying well if you become um if you if you accept islam and i accept christianity then we can be together and get married but it didn't go according to what I wanted. So there was a period way where I um, I would I would I I would try, but he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't give in. So one time I went out to the um, store and I had this idea: if I bought this cross, I could maybe make him feel like. And I very I bought a very very tiny cross and I asked him if if I put it on and you know show you that this is how you know i accept isa is is one of the prophets would you um accept to say the shahada and he says absolutely not so at that time i was living in the asylum center and i have thrown the cross away in the forest um and i never got it back i went out looking for it one day and we broke up right there when he said no um, but because of my addiction to cigarettes, I was um, damn man. Smoker. Wow, smoker and a hey. relationship. What is going on? Damn. <laughs> I know. It's Did you very, your cigarettes now? Very. It was very. Yeah, it's like I I had this like kind of life where I was like good and bad, and you know I couldn't figure out what to 
knew, but I knew in my heart I just wanted to be in heaven. I didn't want to be on earth in that way. So, so, um, so the, you got depressed. I the cross, of that. I try looking for it. I try looking back for the cross. I couldn't find it. And then one night, um, so so in asylum center, we could only go out in the weekends if we claim to go to church because Sundays is the only way you can go out out of the asylum center. So we would lie to the staff and say we were going to church. So that day, so but we knew there was a church somewhere in town we could go to, and just like pretend we are, we just literally sit at the backyard just to make sure we are there. And um, that Sunday, it was a Saturday night where all my friends were like, yeah, are we going to go to town tomorrow? And we need to go, you know, and I said, no, 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 I'm not going to go anyways. So we're done with that lies and stuff. So I went to bed and early morning, um, they knocked at my door and like, are we going again? And I said, no. So I went back to sleep. And maybe an hour later or so, I saw myself in out-of-body experience. So I could see myself in bed. But then I started to have three different flashes, which was like the very first one where I was held by Virgin Mary. And, um, and mind you, during those days, I was really a sad person. I was in so much depth of sadness. I couldn't. I couldn't like I couldn't I couldn't like I couldn't get things over in a, in a way that it was just so sad and so she just held me and she said don't worry everything will be all right and then flash gone and then second flash came in I was in this very beautiful garden um, endless it's it's like without end and I was getting married by Jesus ordaining the marriage. Um, oh, in the dream, what happened again? So it's, I had I had an out body experience. So I could feel and I could see myself out of my own body. Like it's I don't know if I'm not very I'm not very good at explaining myself so much. But so you had out of body experience, and then what happened? So the very first thing I saw few flashes like with flashes of like I saw a scene like a, a scenery of, of where I could see myself and the very first one I saw it was held by Virgin Mary and she held me so tight and she said don't worry everything will be all right and then the second one was I was in a in a it was like it's like a scene that just kept changing very quickly okay and then I saw myself in this very big beautiful garden and i knew it was heaven and it's so, like it's endless let me just go so, late sister so yes you speak very fast okay yeah. so you saw mary and she embraced you and encouraged you then you saw, saw yourself in a garden and beautiful yes. garden. so that's heavenly garden then what happened and so in the garden i was getting married like i was getting married with a person I didn't see. It was like I was at the back. I just could see the back of right. us. Excellent. And Jesus, but I could see Jesus was right in the middle of us and he was ordaining the, the, the marriage. And then the very third scene was what I could have never thought ever would happen. That's when I saw Jesus face to face. And it was like the most glorious, warmest, loving, um, I've never felt love like that. Amen. It's, it's such a, it was an answer prayer that I have prayed uh, in during Ramadan once before. And I asked God, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to pray in Muhammad's name and I'm not going to pray anymore in anybody's name. I just want him to come through for me because I was always feeling lost. Um, I saw this um, uh, amazing light. It was just so warm and heavy in a good way. You know, like when you have a very hugging kind of feeling, 
you know, when you're becoming so restless and then suddenly you are like just held by some someone you love so bad. Yep. Um, and so he asked me not in a physical way, it's like we talked in a spiritual way, like we didn't even move our mouth. Say it again. I couldn't see his face. I couldn't see his face, but I could hear his voice in my but mind. You didn't move your mouth, right? So, sorry? You said you didn't move your mouth, right? No, no, okay. no, I never moved my I'll mouth. A minute. I want to show you something after this. Keep going. Um, and he just asked me, do you know who I am? And as a Muslim, I was like, yeah, I know. And I wasn't like saying it in like, I was so happy. Like when I saw him, I knew this was God. I knew he was my creator. I knew every, like, you know, when you have had this idea or thought of like who your God is, and then suddenly it comes to the, to life. And, and as soon as I saw him, I said, I know who you are. And then he said, will you do whatever I ask you to do? I said, yes. Um, and then he said, well, then open your right hand for me. And I right away opened my right hand and he put his hands on me. And I saw the hole of the nails in his palm. Oh, say that again. Wait, wait. I want to hear that again. Wow, you blew me away. He told you, open your right hand for me. And what did you see? Say it again. I saw the hole of his hand. Wow. Wow. And he he just laid his hand, his hand on my hand and he said, close it. And that's it. I closed my right hand right after and everything was gone. Um... And then I, I found myself sitting on my bed physically in my room. And because I, I knew he, I felt what he left in my hands. I was in, so eager, you know, like when someone, like when a father give you candy or something and said, now you can open your hands, you know, like, or you can open your eyes. I was like, oh my God, I got to open my hand. What did he give me? What did he give me? And he gave me the cross that I threw in the, in the forest, yeah. he gave me the cross that I threw when I was angry. And did you hear it, guys? You see it a miracle? We just witnessed a miracle. Did you hear it? She had a vision of Jesus. He put the cross she threw away in her hand. She woke up, opened her hand. The cross was in her hand. Um. Did you guys um, hear? It? This is why we did the stream tonight. It was for her to come and give her testimony. Amen. Um, so he put, I got up and I, I didn't know what happened. So for a second, I was like, I'm just like numb. I, I didn't go, I didn't understand, you know, what was that? And I tried to go back to sleep and I was like, no. So it's like, he woke me up, back, he, get, he told me not to sit again, not to lay down. And so I got up, I catch the very first train. It's like I was a puppet. He controlled every move of me. I didn't know what I was going, where I was heading. The very first thing I did is catch the very first train that came by. Everything was just in line on time, like exactly when I should be there. And I saw my friends at the, at the train station. I was like, they were talking to me like, you said you're not going to come. I barely spoke a word. I normally would sit at the corner where we smoke in the train cabin, but I went all the way to the silent room, sat there, and I didn't even understand why. Uh, my mouth was shut, everything was like shut. And all I found myself is in that church where we normally would go and sit all the way at the back. Um, even one time there was this um, usher, he came up to me a few times, he's like, hey, just try to stroke a a conversation with me and I score at him. I said, no, I'm a Muslim. I'm just here to help my friends, like, you know, to just get him off my way, you know? So that day for the first time, I walked all the way to the third row. I sat in the front and I understood the message because that time I didn't even understand good English at all. My English was so terrible. Um, and as soon as I got there, the priest 
was talking about grace and mercy. Amen. And it's like all made sense to me for the very first time. And when he, there was an altar call, I was the very first one there. And it's like, God just moved me. I didn't have, I didn't know what was happening. It's like, to me, it was like God just saving me because he knew what I was up to. Yep. And so, um, and he knew in the way I grew up and the way I was doing things, it was never um, possible for me to sit and have a common conversation, like a normal conversation or an open-minded conversation with anybody. Cause I was just full of anger, hatred and all of it. Um, as soon as I was there, I gave my life to Jesus. And once I was walking back to my seat, that's when it's like that veil was lifted and I started weeping and I just didn't understand why. And I said, I started to cry and then behold that Asher who I asked to not talk to me a few months or weeks before came up to me and he said, Hey, why are you crying? You just did a good thing. You know, do you know Jesus love you? And I said, no, I think you don't understand. I think I'm going bananas. I think I'm crazy. What just happened? He said, no, he said, nothing happened bad. Jesus loves you and you know that. And I said, okay, I'm going to tell you what happened. So I told him all my dream or my vision or I don't know if it's, it's a body, it's out body experience. And then he goes and say, and I said, I'm crazy, right? And he says, no, actually you're not. Jesus really loves you. And you know, he started to weep and he went on his knees and he started hugging me. And he said, no, I just need you to understand that God loves you so much. And all he wants is just to have you in his arms at all times. And then he said, and you know what? You are an Esther. And I said, Esther? I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't even know if it's a, it's a name. Um, then he said, a few weeks ago, after we had the conversation, God called me and said, um, he said to me that, I need to pray for you because you are an Esther. And I was like, okay. He said, she's in the Bible and one day you will understand who she is. And so I just went home. My life was never the same again, but yet I received persecutions. I've been tried, they tried to kill me many times and they have tried to do whatever they wanted to do. But you know what? It's, yeah. Now, did you guys yeah. hear okay. who did God use to comfort her and usher? Is it a coincidence what I was talking about, members of the body of Christ? <laughs> no, no, actually not. Everyone here, did you hear again a confirmation to what I just said earlier about 1 Corinthians 12? The usher, someone that you would ignore and think insignificant, yet he's the one God used to comfort her and encourage her and even give her the name Esther. Do you see how everything is falling in place, dovetailing? Do you guys see it? You guys didn't catch that part? I sure. Right. So you got it, sister. So sister, this is an amazing testimony. So all this miraculous confirmation from the Lord. And now finally, the last year, you're now wanting to learn about him, to get to know him more intimately, right? I, yeah, I have, um, I mean, I have, I have learned a few things, but you know, it's, it's been a very struggling situation yeah. because I also have not been very open with people around me because of the, you know, the fear of being harmed and so many things. And so I have tried harder to kind of suppress that. And recently God has spoke to me and he's like, you know what, you're here for a reason and if you fear man, then who am I? You're making me so small. And that's when it's like, you know what? I got I got I gotta start somewhere. And um Well, you came to the right place because here you're gonna learn a lot in depth about the scriptures, but take your journey slowly, learn little by little, understand what you learn and share. Make sure you understand what you learn because a lot of people they hear something, they don't understand it correctly. And then they share wrong information. 
ask the spirit to help you learn a particular view, understand it, and go share it. So you're on the right path. You're doing good. You got all the resources. And if you Amen. sit in, I thought you said something. Anyway, if you ever want to come on my stream and share your conversion story, reach out to me on Skype. If you can give her my Skype, that's the best way to reach me. And let me know it's you. Yeah. Now I want to play some for you. you said when you saw Jesus. I don't have. I don't have. I don't have Skype though. But okay, then I guess we're gonna give you email. My goodness, you ladies, always nitpicking. No, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> The email. You have my email, uh, Albie? I do. Give it to her. But now I'm going to play some for you. Now, remember, you said when Jesus spoke to you, it wasn't using the mouth, right? No, no. It was like, I, it's, it was just like in the spirit. It was never like words that All right. it was like, yeah. Are you ready to listen to this? You ready? You can't see it because you're not in the field, but I'm going to play it. You ready? I got to hear you say yes or no. Stuck for a I didn't hear what you said. Sorry. I said, you, are you ready to hear this? A stuck for Allah, get stuck for Allah. You ready to hear this? I'm going to play something. Stuck for Allah. Yes. Yes, please. Okay. I grew up in Council of Iowa in a Jewish family. My dad had a mantra. Jesus Christ is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. Christians are idiots for having hope. Your life has less significance than the smallest speck of dust in this infinite universe. We were in an accident where another horse ran into my horse. She reared up, flipped over backwards with me on her back and fell across my body. As she hit my chest, I immediately left my body. I was up 30, 40 feet in the air. I just left. I knew I was dead. And as I was up there, I noticed that even though it was a cloudy day, this light was shining over my shoulders. There was a light over my shoulders and it was illuminating everything in front of me. And I realized there was a person standing right there and he moved forward and he was standing. We were up in the air, but we were standing. And uh, he is standing right next to me and I looked at him and he looked at me and it's like, oh, Jesus. Oh, hey, <laughs> it's like, how you doing? I knew that I had known him my entire life. It was not a surprise. I was not shocked. I was not thinking, what is a nice Jewish girl like me seeing Jesus? Why am I seeing Jesus? No, I knew this man. I knew him. And um, he... Just like you knew Jesus was your God. You knew him. You knew he was your God when you saw him. Now listen to the rest of it. He was smiling at me. We were talking, but... I mean, it's not like my mouth was moving, but I know we were talking. You hear that? We were talking, but my mouth wasn't moving. Listen. Right. And he very quickly showed me my life. I didn't have a whole lot to see because really and truly I was a good kid. And he, he, uh, I saw him from the time I was formed in my mother's womb. He had been with me. He had always been with me all my life. And, um, you know, just when I used to talk to God at night when I was a little kid, he'd been there, that he'd been there sitting by my bed. I saw that. After this life review, and I was no longer really looking at the ground, he took my hand and we flew. We surfed. We, I didn't go through a tunnel. A lot of people, I've heard people say they go went through a tunnel. <laughs> no tunnel. It was like we had this wave of light under our feet. And I know my feet were bare because I could feel the wave of light under my feet. And it was pushing us forward. And we were holding hands and flying like Superman and Lois Lane. So faster and faster and faster, I saw a light. And it was getting closer and closer. And it was, it's a living light. And it's the brightest thing you can imagine, but I could look at it. And you would think it would burn you, but it doesn't. It's perfect. It's blemishless and it takes up that light took up my entire field of vision it was infinite in its scope but it was alive and that light was love and Jesus took me directly into the light and the next thing I knew I find found myself sitting on God's lap 
and I have a granddaughter, a two-year-old granddaughter. And you know, if she needs comforting or she wants to be held, she she'll sit on my lap and bury her her face in my chest, and I'll put my arms around her and she'll she'll have her arms around me. That's what I was doing. I was like a little kid. I was sitting on Cod's lap. And I buried my face against his chest and I put my arms around him and he had his arms around me and I never, ever wanted to leave. I didn't want to leave. I just wanted to sit there forever and be held by God. And it's, I can't explain how God can be a light and God can be a man and God can be love. I, I can't explain it. I can't. But that's what I experienced. You see how similar it is to you? All right, I'm going to be straightforward with you. You saw how similar it is to you, sister? Mm -hmm. You both spoke to Jesus, but you didn't move your mouth. And you knew who he was already. You knew this was your God. She was a Jewish girl who at 16 died. And her father told her Jesus doesn't exist. And she was an atheist. But then when Jesus showed up, she knew this was Jesus. And she knew this was her God. So when you see Jesus, you're going to know who he is. He's your God. So your experience is similar. But now you're on this journey. Now learn your faith and grow and study. You have the right resources. And then contact me in the email. We can talk more. And then maybe I'll bring you on on my stream so you won't be on TikTok. You can be on my stream directly on YouTube. Okay. Um, did, did I get the email by a message? or is uh, it No, no, you're supposed to send it to you. You're going to send it to her? Uh, yeah, so I need her to message me because I'm not going to put it in the chat because I don't. We don't need Muslims to have it. That's right. Yeah. So can you message him? How does she message you? Yeah, just, she knows. Just private okay. message. All right. Contact him. I'll give you an email. Then we'll go from there. All right, sister. You there? Oh, she got a phone call. I think. Anyway, you have any more questions after her, or you're done? What's going on? Talk to me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, message him, and it'll give you the email, all right? Yeah, I have already messaged him. Right okay, now. all right. He's going to get it to you. We'll talk then maybe this week, God willing. Thank you. Have a great day, and thank you so much for everything. You know, the Lord bless you. An amazing testimony. It was all for your testimony. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you, sister. All right. All right. My friend, you still have any questions, or you're done? Talk to me. Uh, I think we're done for today. Right. Yeah. Hours, and it was a blessing. Oh, um, no, her, well, this was it. She, we did it for her. She was supposed to come on and share her testimony. Amazing, though, how it corresponded exactly with what you were teaching earlier. Right. The usher came. <laughs> the usher came, right? The usher came showing you those who do not get the limelight are just as important, and they're the backbone of the church. Who gets the limelight? The pastor, the bishop, the priest, or David Wood, or Sam Shimon. And they make us more than we are because we're in the limelight, right? But without the people behind the scenes praying for me, all of us, obviously, or the people on my PayPal Patreon, or coming to the Constant Church, the people who are maintaining the church, cleaning floors, washing bathrooms to keep us... We couldn't do what we're doing, but they're the ones who don't get the attention. Because their reward is with the Lord. Amen. Right? In fact, I want to share one story. I heard this several times. I'm going to end it with this story, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope you didn't think it was a waste of your time. And may the Lord destroy every error and mistake we made and confirm the truth that we spoke and walk in it. I heard this story. I believe it was a true story because I've heard it more than once. There was... Yeah, it is a true story, in fact, because he was on a plane with the, I think, with the president. There was a Christian missionary who spent all his life in the mission glorifying Jesus Christ. True story. I, I, I'm certain it was because the president was on the plane as well. I don't remember what president it was, an American president. But I want you to hear the story, guys. So this Christian missionary spent all his life in the mission field. This is before... You had internet before you had iPhones, and it was time for him to retire. Retire. So his mission organization called him to come home and retire. He had served well. So as he's landing in America, 
before he gets out, the president comes down and he's met with a huge entourage, you know, and all the accolades and the praise and newspaper reporters. And he started feeling sad because when he came out, he didn't have anyone to greet him. It's a story I heard from several people. He felt very sad. No one to greet him. He's like, Lord, all these years I've been in the mission field and not one person comes and greets me. And then he felt a voice tell him, he felt the voice tell him, when you come to heaven, I will greet you. And the host of heaven will greet you. So you have a company waiting to greet you when you come home to me in heaven. That's what the voice told him. <laughs> you guys understand? That's what the Lord was saying. Who cares? Who cares if people greet you? What matters is I greet you. And I'm going to leave you with this passage. What matters is that I'll be waiting. Heaven will be waiting to greet you when you come home and rest. So I want to leave you with this passage. Very emotional for me today. I don't know why. I don't know, but God knows. I'm getting moved in my spirit. One of the most beautiful passages of scripture. Here it is. Let me show you. Acts 7, 55, 56. Stephen is the first Christian martyr. He's the first one killed for his love for Jesus. A Jewish martyr for Jesus. Right before he gets stoned and he's killed, look what happens. Why this is beautiful, why this moves me, because I want you to see something. Before I read this to you, I want to show you, it says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's sitting, not standing. I want you to watch this. Some of you already know this, but it bear, bears repeating. So then, Mark 16, 19, the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Notice, he's sitting, sitting. Okay, watch here. We're about to end it. Watch here. Acts 7, 55, 56. The first martyr who's boldly glorifying Christ and he's willing to be killed without shame. He's honoring Christ on earth. And then right after this, he gets stoned and he's left for dead. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven, saw the glory of God. Now watch. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Not sitting, standing. But we're told he sits at the right hand of God. But now he sees heaven because he's about to die. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open. They're open up, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, what's why is this beautiful? Because though Jesus sits in honor of Stephen, who had honored him, he stood up in honor of Stephen. He stood up to greet Stephen. He stood up to welcome Stephen, saying, Son, time for you to come home. And here I stand up to greet you. You honor me on earth. I honor you in heaven. That's who Jesus is. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, stands up from the throne to greet his servant on earth and tell him, Son, you've made me proud on earth. Good job, you faithful and good servant. And so now I greet you. Come home and now rest with me. This is who Jesus is. Amen. This is my Lord. This is your Lord. This is our Lord. May the same Holy Spirit that filled Stephen fill all of us to love Jesus the way Stephen did and die glorifying Jesus. And may the same Spirit that kept Stephen pure keep us pure to love the Lord Jesus Christ and adore him, to make him proud, to make him happy. Because the most important words i'll ever hear is not the words of men but the words of jesus saying to us saying to me good job well done good and faithful servant enter your rest to hear him say that that's 
the entire focus and purpose of our life. To hear the Master <clears throat> say those words, being pleased with us. Glory to the Father, Son, Spirit. Anyway, brother, I'll see you then, Lord willing, maybe tomorrow. Huh? Amen, brother. God bless you, Sam. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Okay, brethren, pray for us. Pray the Lord grant my daughters and I miraculous security, safety, and protection. Pray the Lord give me strict discipline to get healthier. Break my bondage to gluttony, obesity. Break my bondage to lust. Pray the Lord grant my daughter salvation. They grow up to love the Lord. And I love Jesus more. Become holier. Practice what I preach. Discipline spiritually, physically. Lord, provide for me to do the ministry. Finish the race with integrity. Never fall into scandal. But love Jesus. Pray the Lord bless that young lady or household. And his will be done. That if I can be Jesus third, then he brings it to pass. And we glorify the Lord. And the Lord have mercy on us for our weakness. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will return, physically and bodily. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Holy Spirit. Keep us in love with you. Save our loved ones, my daughters, and bring them to me. In Jesus' name, Maranatha. Take care. See you, Lord willing, tomorrow.